in the small town of Italy, there's a little event known as Monte Saint Vino, and one of the members of a podcast went there and is going to talk about it today on an episode on a podcast known as... <laughs> you turned into Borat. Trapped under plastic. <laughs> I did. That was a terrible Italian accent. I'm sorry to all the legitimate Italians out there. <laughs> Trapped Under Plastic is the podcast where the audience is included on the each episode's uh, pre-production meeting. Yes, that's uh, it. Because we don't discuss it before, and, and then we sound uh, like Borat instead of a true Italian. Yeah. yeah. Mitsubola. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, we, we would definitely have workshopped that intro before, and you would give me some Italian uh, accent feedback, yeah. right? You have, to, you have to be a character actor, and you are Mario. <laughs> yeah. You have to I, talk with your hands. Yeah, <laughs> I am Mario. <laughs> All right, on to the preamble ramble. Uh, I tried out TT Combat's paint range. They sent it to me a long time ago, and I brought it home uh, to my like little home painting desk to use it at some point. And then I didn't paint at home for a long time. But then I started to paint a lot lately, which we can get into why that happened as well. Um, and I, I tried them out, and um, they were they're really cool. The paint was the, – the range is largely very vibrant. So there's like a lot of like saturated like browns, tans, grays, that kind of stuff. Okay. And uh, the paint seems to be uh, maybe a little bit pre-thin. It's not super thick. Mm. Um, and it kind of reminded me a little bit of Reaper MSP paint, but like more saturated. And also, I freaking love their washes. So their washes are all called super straightforward names like cold green, warm yellow, purple, or like, and it's just like they have like 10 of them. And they're, nice. all just, they're just various colors, and they're all just very clearly labeled. And so, I don't know. I actually really enjoyed using the paint ranges, uh, the paint range. Maybe a little bit less opaque, but I kind of understand what I'm signing up for when I'm using a paint range that's not super thick. Um, and it, I don't know, it kind of reminded me of painting with old school GW paints, but just like not shitty, not like <laughs> you know, like not old, like not the old paints, you know, but kind of like the same colors, the same feel, kind of. Uh, it was pretty cool. Oh yeah, that's uh. That's good. I think, you know, because you're most of the time you're going to try to thin the paint anyway. And I get the mindset of like trying to get behind that by like, OK, let's just make that on ramp a little bit quicker, easier. Yeah. Take one of your half steps off. Um, but in those few times, you're just like you really want a crisp, stark edge highlight or a certain detail or something. And not have to go over it two times mm. to do the dot of white in the eye or mm. whatever. Yeah. But I think that's why. You know, like the great Ben Comets, like he uses a heavy body white that's, you know, like Schminka. Just bust that out for that. Yeah, for those few times when you need that, it's typically white, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely there's definitely space in my painting kit for, like, all kinds of dilutions of paint. And it's not, like, super thin. It's just not like, you know how, like, when you take scale or you take, like, uh, AKA Interactive and, like, you, you put it on the palette and it kind of stays as a little blob? Yeah. This, this definitely flattens out a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It looks like that, that button candy that's on the sheet of paper yeah, and you had to peel that off. Oh, what is that called, dude? I thought it was just called button candy, but there is... They call it sugar lumps. <laughs> sugar lumps. <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. and But it's vibrant. That's a good thing, though. Yeah, if yeah. They're already kind of thin. Do you even want to have the punchiness? Yeah. Um. I, so I mean, just from like just using them and trying them out, I I enjoyed painting with them. I I found myself doing a lot of uh, feathering, a lot of like thin layers of translucent paint, uh, building up layers of paint, and it kind of just lent itself to that. And then I enjoyed doing it. I didn't didn't feel tedious. Didn't feel annoying. Uh, I only used it like uh, uh, two or three times, so it wasn't like a ton of times um, for like maybe a two to three hour paint session. So it was chill. Mm. You brought up uh, Reaper paint, so that just reminded me of the the recent Squidmar video. Where have you seen it? Where he said it's like the title, something like "I lied to you" or something. Yeah, okay, I saw the title. I haven't watched the video yet. Though. In the video, I, I give him props for this because it's, it's, there's a not so easy moment that he breaches, and I think it's towards the end of the video. It might be like the the pinnacle of the video, the the build up to it. And he talks about his video where they test, they did all the paint testing. Yeah. Um. And I think he acknowledges that there was uh, some concerns about that. Um, about Reaper MSP in general? Well, no, just about the paint, just the way that they approached the oh, the, scoring. The, the testing and the stuff. Testing. Yeah, sure, sure. But then he goes on to say that, like, Reaper went to the finals of, over all these paints. And that was based on just using, like, a base 10 paint set. And then yeah. after that... Reaper sent him the, their whole range. Oh my god! And he was using it a lot. Yeah. It's like 
I take it back. It kind of sucks. <laughs> oh, man. See, this is the thing. It takes so much work to do that video the right way uh, that I feel like it's not even worth it. And I feel like, especially now, we're like, I've used a lot of like new paint ranges lately, like in the last like two or three months. And man, they're all really similar. <laughs> yes. And I feel like it's just not, it's just not worth it. It's not worth the comparison. It's not worth the work to get that outcome. So I think we have so many good options these days yeah. with just like full ranges. It almost behooves you to just like the, the factors you should use for deciding what paint range you use should be more on what's readily available in your area, Yeah, you know, and you know, what can you get a, a good deal on something or is there a certain company you want to support more? Yeah. Um, something like that. And then just be like, just tell yourself, I'm going to only use this paint range for the next 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, by the time that 12 months is up, you have done the thing that's most important in finding a great paint range is getting accustomed to it and yes. how it works. Right, yeah. Because no range is perfect at every single aspect, but leaning into the things it does well and finding creative ways to deal with the things that maybe it doesn't do as well with, great, but they're all good right now. So yeah, which is why I always scratch my head when another new range is announced. I'm like, well, what's different? Yeah. It's another money-making opportunity for someone. Um, yes. Uh, I want to talk about a couple things real quick this morning. A First things. one I want to do is something we always do at the end of every episode. And so if you're if you're a true goody pee pee, a true one, yeah, right. Like there is a there's like a Frank Frazetta painting where all of the demons and the the corpses of everyone in the battle are all piled up. And then on top, there's a Conan-looking dude in a scantily clad lady in chain mail bikini, because mm. that's every Frazetta painting, yeah. um, fighting a demon, the last demon. With a, ten, with a tendy in hand. With a tendy in hand. Like, they are standing upon the corpses of all others. <laughs> and those corpses in this analogy are everyone that don't make it all the way through the end of the episode of Trapped Under Plastic. <laughs> So if you are a true goody PP and you make it to the end of the episode, you hear where we talk about the ways that you can support us. But I, in, in all my uh, vast podcast listening knowledge, I just realized that just about every podcast I listen to, when they talk about supporting them or supporting them on Patreon specifically, they do it at the beginning of the episode. And I'm like, oh, or, or towards the beginning. So I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> okay. Because if you didn't make it to the end, but you still appreciate it, I, I like listen to like 90% of the the ep, each episode of the podcast I really like, but maybe at the last 10%, which is what we do, is where they call for support. Well, mm. maybe I wouldn't have known that because they didn't do it earlier, so we'll do it now. Yeah. We have a podcast trapped under Pat. We do have a podcast. It's called Trapped Under Plastic. You're listening to it right now. Yeah, Hold on. The, oh, before we do this, is, is the analogy here meaning that listening to our podcast is like fighting hordes of demons? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page. Yeah. All right, continue with the shilling. Yeah, you get up you get up to the top of the mountain and you just didn't quite make it. Like you didn't get that fourth tendy joke in an episode. <laughs> You're just, like, just, you're just like, what the fuck's a tendy, dude? And you're like, ugh. And you just get slain by some random <laughs> goblin from the back. He just scimitars you right through the kidney. <laughs> yeah, that was one of John's fart jokes, that scimitar. <laughs> uh, it's just a reference to some shitty 90s movie. That's that's that one. Okay. Um, but yeah, so we have a Patreon. Uh, we have a $2 tier and a $5 tier. And, and we also have uh, some good rewards for joining us for thank you for the support which is how we're able to keep doing this podcast and as we have an extended version of each episode that's available both in video format as well as audio format so you can still listen to it um while driving or on the go and you can or listen and watch at the same time on two devices <laughs> while driving while driving um so you know if you ever think that you appreciate the podcast and you want to support us you can Give us a couple of dollary dues a month, and we'd greatly appreciate it. Now, back to the regular scheduled preamble ramble. I got a couple of quick things. First thing I was going to do is I was going to bring my smoke ninja that just arrived today, which is the mm. coolest uh, like tech toy in the hobby that I've gotten in a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, of course, I forgot it on my God damn it. kitchen table along with the minis that I painted this week. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I woke up this morning. You ever wake up and you, you had your alarm set? And somehow, like, like the non-conscious version of you turned off all the alarms and your conscious mind never woke up enough to know that the alarm had gone off. I feel like that happened when I was in college, like, a lot. Yeah. That is, and it hasn't happened to me for a long, long time. Happened this morning. 
Okay. Takes me like roughly an hour and a half to drive here. I woke up at 7.33. I pulled into the into your parking lot at 9.01. Dang. <laughs> you uh, got ready in zero seconds. <laughs> yes. Just, you were sleeping in this Costco hoodie is, yes. what, is what you're saying. No, this is set up. This is set aside. Yeah. <laughs> you prepared this I, last night. I prepared this. I had everything else in my bag of stuff to bring. I knew I was going to get a Mountain Dew. Couldn't forget that, but I forgot a couple other things. But I'll bring the Smoke Ninja next time. We can play with that. Okay. But um, a couple exciting things happening in my gaming world. Right oh, now. wow. On topic, preamble, ramble. What the fuck? <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, no, I know. Time stamp this. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh,. I'm in the midst of, uh, in the next month, I will be starting up my new Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Ooh. Once again, uh, re-entering the world of dungeon mastering. I've gone many long sections of my life where I've been an active dungeon master, and we've been going through rotation in our regular group of getting a couple of new uh, players becoming DMs for the first time, and uh, just finishing up uh, Ginger Jesus' campaign right now. Uh, next session will be our last, and then I start. So I've been doing all my prep work. I bought this, uh, a, like, a Dungeon Master's notebook that's all kind of organized, and it's got little tabs on the sides. I've been filling that out. I've been going through all this stuff. So I'm going to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to this. It's a, it's a side of my brain that I really like to use. There's a Dungeon Master wears many hats, um, and each Dungeon Master is a unique snowflake, but uh, my snowflake is big. It's big and <laughs> very interesting. Looking. It's very interesting. It's the most interesting snowflake. So yeah, so yeah, Ginger Jesus, you had your chance. You, you know, you did your thing. You tried it out. Step yeah. aside. Daddy John's coming back. Yeah, to the we're throne. coming back. <laughs> we're coming back hard. hard. We have rules. You have I a got... campaign selected, or are you writing oh, your own? Good question. Good question from the audience. I'm running. <laughs> uh, Fuck you. <laughs> I'm running the. I will be running one from a book. My. F over the years, I've found that my favorite way to run a campaign is to take something that is a established campaign, and then I just kind of use that as the skeletal figure, and then let it evolve based on the player's decisions and what excites them and the directions they choose to go. You're simply there to flesh out the world and give, make it feel alive and give them options. And then what they decide to do will inevitably deviate greatly from what the book thinks is all going to happen but I always have the book to fall back on and then I can just focus my prep work and my being present at a session with the players and what's important there instead of always having to worry about did I create this in my world and did I do all this and this and this um, that is already kind of uh, the base level is established and then I just get to go with that so that's what I do we're doing Kingmaker okay that which is cool. one of the most notoriously um well-reviewed campaigns of all time is originally in Pathfinder 1. They've adapted it a couple of different times, and now it's a total redesign for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, the premise of this is this is the campaign where your PCs um, establish and grow their own kingdom. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, so it has a whole kind of settlement phase from the terms of... of, of uh, uh, board board games. games, yeah. Uh, settlement phase and and rules and abilities and mm. resource points and how and what you're going to do to grow your kingdom, where you're going to do it. Everything down to what kind of government you're going to run. Wow. Yeah, what leadership roles are within those governments. Kind of like Civ, but like the role-playing version of D&D &D with Civ mixed into it, kind of. Yeah, but then you have to, what, and what I've already told my group because um, I think it's really important to not pretend you know it all or have it all figured out with your with your group. Also, when you're just playing a, you know, tabletop game, um, mini war game and stuff too, is it? Don't ever pretend you know it all. No, oh, yeah, um, you will get some rules wrong. But as I, I went into this, and I've already told them like we're gonna find the version of how we run the kingdom together and what works best for you. Because it can be very time intensive. And the last thing I want to do is spend a five hour session with three hours working the kingdom phase, right? And they want to dig in and, 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 and work on things that are about, you know, looking, exploring new areas or, or doing certain quests or, or following up with NPCs or going after a big bad monster or something. Um, then that's what we want to do because if that's what excites them. So how much of that can we offshoot and do between sessions? Yeah, you know, can we do stuff through text? Can I I give you guys 
here's what your resources are, here's are what your options are. You guys discuss it among yourselves in decision making, not at the gaming table. Okay. And you come back to me the next week, that kind of thing. So we're gonna mm, you're giving them fucking homework. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Dude, if the DM does homework, the last the it's not too much to ask is the PCs, you know, it's a it's a respect thing. Okay, know? is it okay. Yeah. And I always that I I very rarely have issues with my players at the table more than understanding personalities work differently and play games differently. That's a thing and not think that they're terrible people because what they choose to do or how they choose to have fun is one thing. But to the thing that only really upsets me about people who play games is that they put all the work on other people and kind of give this entitled thing where it's like, well, I just show up and then your job is to entertain me. It's like, no, no, no. My novice understanding of D and D was that the relationship was that. That the you know, as a DM you are accepting an increased workload over the other players. And so you kind of just show up and make the choices that your player would make in the situations that that the DM is presenting, but that's just it. They're the ones presenting and crafting that narrative. But I mean, I'm down for anything. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. And you're absolutely right that the dungeon master is does have the the heavier workload. They absolutely should. And so we do a we do a rotation of food. So mm, what we do. Is there you go. That's we, how you pay. We eat every session. We do a meal and we have a food rotation. There's like a chart of how it goes and who's in charge of food for the longest time. We switched out of this, but I may bring it back. For the longest time, the DM never had to. Oh, you're gonna it. bring it back now that the year the fucking <laughs> now, DM. Now that I'm the DM, <laughs> you skis. Feed me peons. <laughs> I I agree. I honestly, that's an easy way that someone can pay without like homework or anything extra. It's like you should pay for this time in a small way, and that's yeah. a small way. That's a huge feed yeah. me grapes one at a time. Well, yeah, okay, well relax. Okay. I'm a silver platter. <laughs> uh, the other thing that is hold like, on, my turn. Oh shit, you, you got more. Slots. You did more things. Yeah, I did more. I do so many things, bro. All right, let me so hear about in your this, things. In the same vein as what you're describing right now, uh, my my friends and I have been playing descent and we're three sessions deep in it and we're we're feeling a way about it which is discouraging us from investing more time in the system um it's like it kind of feels like all you do in the game and curtis mentioned this first and i started to think about it more and it feels like it's kind of right you you have a character you're on this grid system Mm -hmm. and all you want to do is walk up to a, a monster you want to hit it. You want to hit it two times. You have two actions you can do in this game. So ideally, you're you're attacking every monster two times to kill it as fast as you can. Okay. You don't really know how effective your attacks are going to be because, like, you consult the app, and then the app considers this number of features, like your character, its special abilities, the monster it's attacking, what items you equipped, and what chances they have to do things. It's like a glorified turn-based video game. Um, and there's a very optimal way to do everything. You kill the monsters, and then you interact with everything in the room. And that's just that's what you do in the game. The um, I'm sure. And so it's just kind of boring. Um, I like that mid-sentence you burped and did not even <laughs> stop. <laughs> I'm channeling my best Rick right now, you, dude. You burped a word. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically it's... It's it's kind of it's kind of it's a little boring, you know. You you have one die you roll for combat, and so it feels a little swingy. There is a cool puzzle to solve um, with fatigue and cards and flipping cards without getting too deep into it, but uh, it just feels not very. Uh, it feels like you could you could write a program to play this game, walk away, and it would beat it in forty hours. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and like okay. and what's the cool thing is like the story behind the characters that get revealed, the choices you make, and how it like and how it shapes that narrative. That's not why I play a I board play, game. Yeah, I don't play board games for story. Yeah, so maybe there's a cool story that, that would add to the experience, but like what I play the game for is an interesting mechanical puzzle to solve, and it doesn't seem to be a very challenging one. So we decided last night that we we're going to discontinue playing Descent, and we instead played Doom and, Dune Imperium, which that game fucking rocks. Hey, if you find a game that you like to play, that's the answer to your question. But, but we want a cooperative campaign-based game. We want to play that. And we just don't know which one to play. And I know that Gloomhaven is the one that's like super popular, but like we don't necessarily need like a D and D experience. If that happens, totally chill with that. But also a game like Curse City is not a D and D game, but is a cooperative campaign based mm-hmm. system, you know? And so I was gonna toss the question over to the goody peepees. What's your recommendation for a campaign cooperative board game system that, that me and my friends could play? We don't really have any preferences about anything. I want the game just to be good. Just the gameplay actually to be good. Those Descent minis, I wish the game was awesome because the minis are so They're cool. amazing. The 3D terrain is amazing, but it kind of all feels needless because really you just point and click on the thing on the app and it yeah. tells you what you found and what you did and to keep track of your inventory and, and how, what you can craft and all these things. It just, uh, 
I don't mind an app, but it feels like it's doing a lot of lifting. And uh, for one person to have it on their cell phone, and everyone's kind of just sitting there being like, okay. For the app to tell you? Consult the book! And it's like you do the things, and then it's just like, it's not a great experience. Like the uh, Oh, so each activation in combat has to consult the fucking app? You, you click on your character, drag no. an arrow to the monster, let no. go, and then it does an attack sequence. I've, I've played board games like that, too, and that's too far. That's a bridge too far for me. It might be, yeah. So, I don't like it. Yeah. I like it when it's there to add parts of the campaign side of things mm. or the read alouds like you get some cool atmospheric music and then the cool voice reading the stuff like all that kind of thing is great yeah. tracking parts of your campaign through an app all that's great all that's great yeah when you get into my like turn by turn need to use that thing uh-uh bitch i don't yeah. want that yeah um i got two i got two comments slash questions okay uh the first one is i'm looking at your giant pile of board games straight behind the camera from that video and you got one that i'm looking at right now that i would recommend okay and you've probably then played it which okay. is lord of the rings journey of middle earth we have a campaign with a different group playing that game and that game is good it's a fucking good game. i don't mind playing that game that's yeah a good game yeah that, that game surprised me because the look of it, like the box and just like the looking, models are a little childish. Yeah. And, and looking at the back of it and kind of how it goes, it's kind of underwhelming. It doesn't look like it would be that great of a game. It looks kind of like a generic throw an IP on a shitty ass game yeah. and to try to sell. Yeah. Yeah. Push yeah. them units. Mm -hmm. um, very good game. Yeah. Um, that one's cool. OK. So then my question about Descent is, do the characters not have their own unique abilities based on what class they are like and, and choosing how they attack you do uh so each character has two sides to their unit card and you can flip them at any moment flipping is a whole thing in the game it removes oh. fatigue and effects and it gives you a different set of abilities and i believe each unit card has uh an ability one ability on each side okay. so technically each character has like two unique things that only they can do um and then throughout the course of the game you are going to collect items and stuff like that. And there are items that are specific to characters. Um, and then these will then give you additional abilities to use, both on the front and back side of the card. And so, like, the, the thing about the game is you roll a die and stars are successes. Those, those are good. But lightning bolts are also good. But you can only turn that into a success if you spend fatigue. And the more cards and things you get, each card will have a capacity for fatigue, and so you can put fatigue on these cards, and then you lose the fatigue when you flip the card, but you have a different set of abilities then, maybe more defensive, less offensive. And so there is a bit of an action puzzle there. We're trying to figure out the most optimal side for your cards, but really how, what, it, what it is is, like, okay, I'm going to go through a doorway, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discover a new room. I'm going to have to kill things, so I'm going to start right, right now before I open the door or start the event that's going to trigger more monsters. I'm going to make sure I'm on the right side for everything. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I'm going to go. And it's just like, it's, just, it, it's that way every single time, and so it kind of just feels like I've solved it and I've only played three times. That may be not true, but I sent a message on my Instagram asking, hey, this game feels this way. Does it, did, did, For anyone who's played it more, it, does this, does it get better? And I got... I'm not even kidding you, 20, over 20 messages, and every single one said it doesn't get better. And several, several of them, three of them said, watch the review from Shut Up and Sit Down. It says what you're saying. And so I watched it, and it's like, yeah, that's what they say the game is like. And so, it's, so that's when I was like, okay, hey, coffin in the nail. Like, we shouldn't invest more time in this experience if it's not going to be great. Models are amazing. The 3D terrain is amazing. The lore seems pretty interesting and cool. It's like an interesting world. But it's all like candy on a Sunday that made of turds that tastes, I don't want to say it's not turds. It's not a terrible game, you know, but it's leaving, it's leaving something to be desired. Uh, it, it feels like it's, um, it's a game. A lot of these kinds of games where it's a board game, it's kind of molding with an RPG or a tabletop skirmish kind of a game yeah. that the evolution of those has happened pretty rapidly over the last five to 10 years. And it, it feels just a little dated. Like, that's kind of how they were. That feels closer to a Hero Quest style game than it does to, like, a Gloomhaven style game. Yeah. It, you're, yeah. There are times when you get to pick choices for your characters that then shape their personality and, like, what choices they get in the future. So that feels a little D&D-ish, but mm -hmm. I think you're right. So I think there was an interesting comment that said, like, the game has lost sight of what makes not only a board game special, but also what makes D&D special. Oof. And kind of hit somewhere in the middle. So I'll also say this, to, to offer a different point of view, another big 
review channel called No Pun Included that I really like, really loves the game. Mm. So they, they totally went against everything I'm saying now. Oh. Um, in my playing of that board game video that came out recently, I played a lot of games like that. And my favorite of all of them was a game called Oathsworn. Mm. Oathsworn had like a, a 45 minute narrative section that was tablet or app driven. And you went to parts in the city, you talked to people, you got information. But then once the combat instance started, the app went away. And at level one, it was an interesting combat. It was cool. It was it was tough to solve. It was fun to play in. And there was no app. It was all just pl- fighting with cards and other things like that. And so that and that was about 90 minutes long, about twice as long as the narrative portion. So I love that delineation between the two, like app here, not here, fun combat right out of the gate. No grinding, no items needed, just as fun right away. So I, I think if I were to pick one, that's the one that I would pick. But also I love recommendations from anyone else who's oh. tried. You tried Bardsung, right? Yeah, we're almost done with our Bardsung campaign. God damn, how's that? The, we're in the discussion of what we're going to play next. Okay. Um, Bardsung is... It's really good until you kind of start to see the matrix. Mm. Um, we got into a point in the last couple months where it it is so many missions to go through a campaign. It is the they needed to cull a lot of that. They needed to cut trim a lot of fat on it because it gets real samey same. Okay. Um, and the core of the experience per, in a session is really fun, but very little changes. And once you've kind of done it, and we've we've gotten our xp and and we have bought the new abilities that we wanted to buy or whatever and you kind of get to a point where you feel like the game your campaign should about be over the way all the other resources and all the other stuff has been collected and then we look through the campaign book and we were like halfway done and we're like what the fuck are we gonna do and so what we decided to do because we're not gonna not finish it was we counted each uh, um successful mission as two so we would just instead we would basically do every other mission yeah to keep moving and we made sure if there was big boss fights because it's kind of a different layout and different way the game rules work in boss fights and stuff we make sure we'd anyone we'd come across those we would do them but it's a solid game and i i don't dislike it there's a lot of parts of that game i really like but there's some parts that i'm just like ah this just wasn't quite tested enough for them to see the full scope of a full campaign but yeah, and I feel that. I feel that about a lot of these games that come with so many supplements and like mm-hmm. things. It's like, how could you have really made these well when there's there's so many things, right? There's so many. Um, and oftentimes I feel like they haven't or they're just, like, I don't know, overdoing it maybe. I don't know. I think that's the the push in the arms race of board games is more. Mm. Just more is better. I think you're right. Yeah. Especially in the Kickstarter world. Right? Yeah, you're you totally get right. more. So you can play this game solo, uh, 1v1, cooperative, uh, uh, all versus one, and a DM-like experience. And it's like, you know what? Just do one thing well. But you're totally right. It is the Kickstarterification of board games that's causing these problems. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what we're going to play next. Uh, Oathsworn is on our list, so that might be what we play. Cool. I also want to look at Frosthaven because I know Frosthaven has, and Gloomhaven alike, have a cool combat thing just right out of the gate. It's just interesting. Yeah, no dice rolling. Yeah, cool. yeah, just like card playing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would, I, not having played Frosthaven, but having completed um, Gloomhaven, I would probably recommend you just go right into Frosthaven. Oh, okay. Because they're not like a link thing, like you had to play one before the other, but it's just a lot of things have been fine-tuned in the, the mechanics of the game. Okay. You know, it's kind of like when a video game comes out and there's a new version of it, but you never played the original one, but it was like at one or two consoles ago. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it just yeah. might not hold up as much. I bet it's not that bad. I mean, that game was really, really good. And they did, when Frosthaven came out, they released Gloomhaven 2.0. So yeah. maybe that's a better option there is to play the newest version of Gloomhaven that's been gone through an extra level of refinement mm. and distinguishing. Yes. I, I selfishly want to play Cursed City just because of the number of models that I have painted for that game. And I feel like this would be fun to actually play with painted models. But I know, I mean, I think you also know that that game isn't like super amazing. My, yeah, my daughter and I started a campaign. We played four missions, I think. And it's it's just not good. Yeah, it's, it's uh, not. Yeah, good. Okay. I mean, if you if you want a really base level kind of um, hero quest style game, it's just it's quite vanilla, and there's not a lot of depth to it. It's not bad. It's not bad. But like you know, we if if my ad, 
10, 10 year old daughter is kind of like <laughs> just screaming it is uh, it's destroying all the monsters. Destroying monsters and she was kind of getting bored i'm like okay i don't feel bad about getting bored <laughs> so she was getting bored okay yeah but and she even like loves playing the archer and no matter what game we play she wants to play the archer and there's a badass elf archer in this and she was so excited and then she's like oh this is not as fun as the archer in massive darkness and I'm damn like, bro oh i'm like that's bad news bears because massive darkness isn't that good <laughs> <laughs> uh massive darkness too it's okay um my last thing here is that um we've officially started the train rolling on an upcoming escalation league for age of sigmar oh yeah all right yeah, so, all right, um, all right. So I was able to recruit a uh, good buddy, Derek, who runs all of our 40K goodness in our area. And I was like, Derek, you're really, really good at this. All right, play Age of Sigmar, please. Yeah. Derek's like, wanna, fine. Why don't, you do, and why don't you do this and also uh, do all the work? Um, <laughs> but uh, he's got, uh, he's been uh, investing. <laughs> He's been investing in Slaves to Darkness, so he's getting there. We got a bunch. Of, he said, like, of his local 40K group, there's 8 to 10 that are interested in getting into Age of Sigmar. Okay. We got our kind of uh, in hibernation regular Age of Sigmar group of roughly that same number of people locally. So and then you have the Ringer John, who's yeah. going to come in and be a tryhard and kill all these first-time yeah. AOS players. Oh, I mean... Uh, Soul Black Grave Lords are really strong. They right are now. really strong right now. I do They're still a, really strong. Yeah. I do have 120 zombies, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a whole different kind of <laughs> zombies. Yeah, because like I didn't, I didn't do that. Like, but there are many things about the faction that are really good right now. Mm. Zombies being one of them for sure. Yeah. So that's our plan is to kind of get the communications and and everything rolling in December and then start around February. Okay, so and you're not gonna play uh, Slaves of Darkness? No, I changed. I changed my mind. Um, mostly because didn't... they're in a really bad spot right now. Like they were really strong and they just got nerfed. Shit. Yeah. Okay. And then also Derek was really interested in them. I'm like, I don't want to do a thing. No guy's gonna do. Okay. And you're gonna do Soul Blight? I don't know. Okay. I might do some version of Cities. Oh. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Also, the new Flesh Eater cards were just shown. There are some actually that are pretty cool, but also, oh my god, fucking Usharan has a model, and you're not a super fantasy nerd, but that's one of the fucking original vampires. Yeah, uh, I had a regular hangout with Vince the other day after those are announced, and he was telling me all about it. So, oh, he was. So he told you about Aberash and yeah. Sauron. So I hope what this means is we're gonna see an Aberash model, a Sauron model. Uh, we already have Arcane the Black, and we already have a Neferata, but maybe like a. Maybe like a souped up version of Neferata or something like that, because mm -hmm. that that is like the AOSified Usharan that I, like everyone wanted and imagined. Now I want to see like, show me Aberash, like the 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 blood dragon. Like what does he look like Ooh, as a big baby. nasty vampire? You know, from the new sculpting yeah. abilities, yeah. Of Age of combat combat king vampire. Dra blood. He drank the blood of a fucking dragon to cure his uh, eternal thirst. Like. He's awesome. Yeah. The best thing about the Usheron model I love is this how he's holding the scepter. He's holding the scepter like he's a like he's a queen or he's like a, a dairy princess at a parade. <laughs> he's just kind of like holding it like he just the most like elegant way. And like it so works. They're they're finally leaning into the the we think we're actually royalty kind yeah. of a thing. And I, I I really dig that. But but looks sexy like T Joshy plays flesh eater quartz. Okay. So it, well, Josh, you know, you, you have to play a different army now. <laughs> Maybe I'll just play Mega Gargants. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess. I never know what army you want to play in AOS. I mean, I always want to play Soul Blight. Then I just fucking play Soul Blight. Yeah, I mean, I probably will. I, got have, a bunch, a, I have a bunch of army painted. Yeah, okay, there you go. I like how Usharan seems like he's in like a weightlifting competition because he's like doing like one of these numbers. He's like showing off them fucking traps, dude. <laughs> He's uh he's all hunched over. He's a little hunchback Notre Dame. Yeah, meets Dairy Princess. That's, all right. his, that's his thing. Well, the preamble ramble included a little bit of everything. You know, a little bit of uh, news, a little bit of gaming, everything other than painting, I guess. Yeah. Which I guess we can get into right now. Um. Oh yes, yeah. What were we painted? What did you paint? So, uh, I went to visit uh, Roman Lapot. We did a painting of. Uh, for our a private coaching, and I painted the Ghoul Queen, the Ghoul Queen. Oh, this one we talked about in a previous episode. That is the based on the Brahm artwork. 
Based on Brom artwork, when I first saw it, it reminded me a lot of Bav Morda from uh, Willow. Yep, uh, yep. She just looks like that, an evil queen lady. I mean, she's called the ghoul queen after all. Mm. What the fuck is this mom? She doesn't look like a ghoul, though. Like, she, they're all ghouls. She's not a ghoul, but she is a queen. I know, yes. Over them. So I didn't finish the model. I, I think I finished the face. That's what I worked on the most. Oh, man, he sent me all the, he sent, he sent me home with these things, too. Oh, fucking sick. All right, cool. So I'll have things to show during that discussion. Um, so I painted, I painted her, the face of her uh, using the, the coaching uh, lessons that Roman was teaching during, during that. Um, mixture of AK, Vallejo, whatever Roman had. It was just a random assortment of paint. Mm -hmm. I just kind of grabbed it based on what colors I needed. Um, painted a, a face in a, a typical way that I normally paint, but what I tried to do this time was I tried to ha paint it like there was a, a light in the top front of her head and so it's mm -hmm. shining more strongly and so i have less cast shadows uh specifically in this area of the face yep. um i kind of lit, lit that up more and then on the uh, along the the chin line it's it's darker with shadow yep. i'm excited yeah you can definitely tell that it's just above and in front of her yeah um and that was because i was painting from a concept art that uh roman had um but the rest of the model isn't painted i think once the other parts are also painted in that same way maybe the effect will be stronger yeah, as I hope it will. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, I painted that. Um, okay. Yeah, we're gonna talk more about that in the main topic today. Mm -hmm. It looks mm -hmm. good. It looks, it looks, it looks good, but it still feels like you. It's kind of one of those things I worry about. Like you go into a, a, a heavy coaching where it's like you you end up do you end up morphing too much into their style and then. It doesn't. You don't feel comfortable at at all the whole time, and sometimes that can be a really good thing to experience something totally outside. But instead, folding in the things to what you already part of your workflow. So it feels like there's still you here, but there's things here that I can tell um, are different from. I guess if you sat at your own table and put the same amount of hours into this. Yeah, I definitely would paint it in a different way. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about all those things that I learned in the main topic. That's that's number one thing. Okay. 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 You want me to do one thing then? Yeah. Sure. 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 Um, one thing I did in the hobby, which was outside of something for a video, was recently released a video on the doing all the composition and building my scene for my next Golden Demon piece. And since doing that, um, I've changed a fair bit <laughs> on that piece. I have replaced two figures. I re worked where the positionings of the figures are. I've added this big dude in armor with a big axe instead of like the dude with a pot belly with a mace over his shoulder in the middle to take up more space to kind of ground the piece, not so feel so floaty um, and to kind of deal with some a, a dead area that Willie Hanna kept holding me was, was kind of there um, towards the, the bottom of the feet of the horse. There was just kind of a, a, a blank area and this kind of covers that. And then this picture, are you talking about? Yeah, that's that's the new one. That's the new one. Um, so where it was is where basically where his axe had the whole head of the axe. That was all blank before. There's this. It was like a big oval, a vertical oval. Oh, okay. I thought, I thought the blank is. area was like under where the horse is above his head or something like that. Um, no, because there it, there's a lot of shadow in the picture because it's shot with my phone. Gotcha. But it's yeah, you see, that'll be the underside of the horse. There. What is this model? It's from the new Cities of Sigmar. They're like. Uh, it's a kit that's got like five different heroes in it. Okay. But in that kit, that dude is like the big burly armored dude. There's a whole section of armor that's not attached to it and an over helmet that's not attached okay. to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to attach. He seems a little top heavy though. He's like a chunk and then yes. he's got a tiny little baby head. The problem with the head is that like they have an over like helmet that closes on it, which then gets bigger. He's an astronaut. Right. <laughs> um, but the sh he has extra shoulder pads and chest plate that's two pieces off the front and the back and makes him even more look like he would just fall over from being so top heavy. <laughs> um, that's the head that's in there. And I, I, I like the big bearded look, but it is kind of it is slightly small. <laughs> but also it's kind of realistic in that when you're wearing a big bulky armor and your naked head is sitting out, it looks tiny because you don't have big bulky armor over your head. OK. I haven't. I'm not a hundred percent on that. That's just sticky tack down there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I haven't decided. I might try different 
uh, different heads there. But and Wizard, then I got Wizard to add man. the I added the assassin. Yeah, this man slaps. Yeah, this model is sick. Off on the right side, if you're, if you're looking at the picture now, the guy with the dagger coming out of his his cloak. This guy oh. looks sick. So the the catalyst for this was feedback from the great and powerful Darren Latham, and he was like, he was like just telling me he's like like a lot of the stuff that's going on here. I really really like there's there's one one thing that he didn't really like was this vertical nature of on the left and right sides. I used to have the guy holding the spear, the kind of like pot belly guy, captain of the guard looking dude. Yep, with the spear. And the other side, I had. Uh, the young guy with the head in a box on a stick. And what happened is, mm. is because they were flanking the sides of the piece, it ended up looking like goalposts. Like it was, they were both going straight vertical and then halfway up them or towards the top of them, it went straight horizontal with the whole horse being back there. He's like, that is, it's too symmetrical and it kind of, it, it ruins the flow of movement. And so, we had some options. I was looking at different arms to hack off that spear arm. He's like, it'd be better if it was whatever he's holding is either angled in, so it's pointing you towards the um, towards the rider, or would be slightly less strong, would be pointed out off of the base. And I was like, I just I can't find anything that really sticks to me. I really like that model, the the captain of the guard model. Uh, but he's like, well, build some other models and just put them on there and see what happens and i built that assassin dude first and i put him on there i'm like fuck yes yeah any excuse i get to paint that dude too because that dude really excites me to paint yeah dude so um yeah. from there he was like that's it he's like that's it and he's like then he turned to that dude in the middle he's like i don't really get what this guy's job is and i'm like i know he's not really interesting either like he goes with the storyline i was trying to tell but you don't need to slap people over the face with something that doesn't look pleasant to look at because it fits the story and it just kind of makes the piece less interesting as a whole so that's kind of what i went with so okay okay so may, that was it may i offer some unsolicited feedback you absolutely can um you have a lot of people telling you how to do this and oh, so the comment section of that video oh my god i can't even imagine i didn't even think about that it is ridiculous yeah okay so you have to pick and choose what you want to listen to obviously yeah. right include even obviously including this uh the goal pulse thing totally get I feel like if you wanted to have a guy that was holding another stick thing, he had he would have to be left-handed, right? The fact that they're both right-handed definitely makes it a little bit bizarre. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely like the other guy more than this guy you had. But I get the thing about the width. You want to block that. Yep. Um, but I also feel like there's not a lot going on right here in this, this black hole. And I get I get it's a shadow, mm -hmm. but it's the under of a horse. There's no armor under there. You might see like a belt for like the saddle and stuff. But I feel like could that be blocked a little bit more and made more interesting so this whole front view is all interesting thing because it feels like ring hole in the middle yeah i don't know um yeah because it, it, it kind of worked with the circular composition where you have some spaces for the eyes to breathe that's okay. what i was told anyway okay sure 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 um which i which i get but yes that but there's also a fine line of you you can't have a, a void right a void sure. is still an issue part of the composition which was my goal from the get-go was in a weird way the guy on the horse is almost like a backdrop well, okay he's, he's like mm. he's the the back wall and everything's kind of foreground and then he is just kind of takes up all that space in the vertical over and looking over top of them okay but you're you're not wrong i don't th then it's it's the question of then like then how much do you do what does it get too busy does right. it does it fall off of um, not having those areas that are kind of in shadow, just basically not existing because you're putting something in front of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, one thing Willie Hanna kept having me do was taking the pictures like this with just a white sheet of paper behind them because then you really can fully see, all the, out see the outline and stuff, which I haven't done yet with that one. So That would be interesting. Um, nothing's uh, been glued down. Then I had to re-sculpt and kind of redo stuff on the base, which I had the whole thing primed black. And then I went through and did multiple layers of uh, a bad and black through an airbrush across the base rim to give you that that shiny black, and it looked so freaking good. I was so it was just a, a small victory moment of it looking like a, a 
cohesive sculpted one piece base mm. and then i go through with like yellow milliput and sculpt on top of it and it was just kind of like hurt my heart a little bit to, to <laughs> do it but it, you have to do that either you don't have to but if you don't do it now how much is that a snowball of negatives that's going to affect what yeah. your final piece is which is my whole point of this whole fucking thing is not to screw it up before i yeah a uh, paint but at a certain point you got to paint easy to fix um the other uh feedback the, are these guys on the left and right of the diorama are they the same height yes what if what if homie over here was a little bit taller than this guy so you had like step 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 um they're they're the same height but they're not on the same um size the same step on the base okay so that guy on the left is the the furthest up so there's technically four steps oh the dog is on step one big dude is step two assassin is step three uh, dude with a head in a box, step four, and then the highest is the dude on the horse. But so, effectively, they're both the same height composition. Um, when you look at it straight on, the dude on the left with the head in the box is roughly a head taller. Oh, then okay, never mind. Uh, I was just saying they're like a, you have a nice stagger, except right here, it's like they're at the same height, and it felt, yeah, it felt that, and that changed a little bit when that's just sticky tack down. When I sculpted oh, where the assassin, I just resculpt entirely where the assassin was standing gotcha. and i had to cut off there's like a little bramble stick coming off of the base of where the horse dude on horses i had to cut that off so i could push him back a little further because the same thing when you look at it from the top they're also tiered back and forth as they go deeper into the piece mm -hmm. if you're looking from top down mm -hmm. and so i wanted the assassin guy not so parallel with dude with axe so i had to push him back even a little further and then that allowed me to sink him down a little bit more um so he's not Quite, yeah, I didn't do not want heads at the same height on the opposite sides. Yes, yes, I think that'd be a little weird. Yep. Um, Good call, though. Cool. Yeah, those are my those are my two thoughts that I saw when I looked at it at first. But um, it still looks pretty awesome. You know, pretty pretty awesome. Like like the last one did too. I my goal is I want to get everything a hundred percent. So when we hit VinciCon, I'm gonna can paint some of those at VinciCon. Cool. My goal is to paint one entirely at VinciCon. Um, and then I'm gonna paint one of them. Um, try hard. A try hard, you know, GW Evy Metal style um, painting video with one of those figures featured, because um, then it's like, well, I get, I have to, I have to paint for videos. I have to paint this for Golden Demon. I'm gonna try to do it. I did it last year with one zombie. A single zombie um, is was is an easier figure than many of those. Mm, but, yeah, detail wise, yeah. Uh, that, right. that, the biggest issue I have with Big Dude with armor is that that guy is gonna be a, a bear to paint. Because I don't want to do it in true metallics, but I because I think it would end up. Oh, you hit a ha! Did you hit a button? Um, I don't want to paint him in true metallics because I think it would be too boring, and because he's so much metal. But painting that in non-metallics and keeping the light sources consistent is going to be a, a going to be paramount. Yeah, um, maybe some things I learned about in my private coaching with Roman might help to make that consideration of lighting and having the models be, be married together a little bit easier for you. Oh, good. We'll discuss that in the main topic then. Um, last thing I, I painted real quick was I finished a model that I had started when I was just uh, got into painting Warhammer uh, five, six years ago. I remember that conversion. Yeah, I converted a Nurgle demon prince for my uh, Death Guard army, and he just kind of sat 50% painted for five years, and... <laughs> It's just a fun exercise to go through and something that you had started and how your paintings evolved, uh, what you would change, and then how do you finish up the paint job for the things that you kind of didn't want to paint or didn't excite you back then mm -hmm. in a way that you can just knock them out in one evening. So finish that that dude in a, in about three and a half hours. So God damn. So you got a bunch of dudes with bows here, my friend. I painted a Greyjoy army as well. <laughs> oh my. Uh, cause I had to shoot, kill your friends on Saturday. Um, the second episode. So I guess that means if I shot it now, it'll come out three years from now. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. Me, me and Curtis finally played our game of, uh, kill your friends and that should be coming out. I don't know. I mean, it's going to be rough, but it has, it's going to come out in hopefully the first half in the middle of December. Um, and so here I didn't bring them all over here cause I don't have a huge table to look at stuff, but, um, I got uh, my army painted up, two units of drowned men, so those guys, a unit of iron makers, a unit of bowmen, a unit of silence men, and then um, a handful of characters, uh, single model characters. Are they supposed to be on here like this, painting like, looking like that? Because that's uh, where the water lines up? Um, no, they're not. Um, 
So uh, yeah, about that. So my, my bases are all that resin cast stuff, and some have wood on them, some have water on them, some have oh. sand on them, or a combination. And so it's just a it's just, it's just a random mixture of I think sea it. life stuff. Um, and so I did the same thing with the movement trays. But my, man, my God, I haven't painted a fucking movement tray in a <laughs> long time. I was painting the base room on these movement trays. And I was like, dude, it's been fucking 15 years since I've done this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I didn't I didn't continue the wood detail to the movement trays yeah. because I was crunched for time, but also because I didn't know how to cleanly cut out circles out of like wood covering a corner of the base or something like that. There's probably a method, but it would have taken too long to figure it out. The amount of hours invested versus final product yeah. outcome yeah is, sometimes you gotta you gotta trim that stuff because it's the juice isn't worth the squeeze on how much it's gonna take for you and what it's actually gonna give to the final piece yeah i think i think they look great and i think that the having the having the wood on the regular bases still works well because it still kind of lives in the same environment and tells the story you it feels very um you know very on the shores um, which is really, really yeah, cool. It's like a vibe, right? It's not like a, it doesn't make 100% sense. And also, I'm not going to put the models in the same spot every single fucking time I play and things like that. So I wasn't too concerned about like having consistent water lines and stuff. This one, especially the the vibrancy, or the, the pushing of the highlights from the top of the model down to the bottom really, really works really well. Yeah. It's at that tabletop level even. It's like, it's so good. Yes. It works when you've got bare heads. When you have dudes with helmets, it's it's harder to pull that off. Yeah, yeah. These guys, if I had a so, if I had to do these more, I think making their faces and helmets brighter and the silver on the helmets brighter as well would be what I would do. Um, because I don't know, if, I really had a crunch to to paint all these models for this army. I had to paint at home at the office, so I was painting a lot. Like my fucking carpal tunnel thing started to come oh, back yeah. again. Um, where you get like you get like seized up. Uh, my just my wrists, my oh, wrists starts to hurt. They just hurt. They both hurt. Yeah. Oh, I get that if I'm painting too much for a long period of time. Like I'll go, like go to rinse my brush, and like my hand is just my whole hand is cramped. It's oh. just like I can't move it. Damn. Okay. I, it only lasts for a couple of seconds. I'm like, oh wow, because I just realized I've been flexing muscles mm. in the exact same pose for too long. Yeah. Like, yeah. Ah, ah. So yeah, I painted. I mean, I guess 2023 is the year of Scott getting painted armies. Uh, Jeez. But- the other thing that's hard about Song of Ice and Fire is that I never play with the same exact list. In fact, the list I used on our episode was a list I've never run before, which is not saying much. Like, it's very easy to swap in and out an NCU or an attachment. Yeah. It's, it's, it's got the same bones, but it might play a little bit differently. Um, and I think so I, that's a positive for a game. Oh, I fucking love it. No? I fucking love that about this game. Uh, but um, it, was just, it was hard to know what to commit to <laughs> what am i willing to invest the amount of time to paint <laughs> yeah 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 and so i actually had a couple options um but yeah i got, I got my great Joy army done and painted up and but like it's not really done because there are other units that i want to paint because again i'm changing all the time and so i want to be able to swap things in and out um but it's a more achievable bite-sized bits at this point right mm-hmm. so i'm gonna yeah. swap out this one unit that means i'm only gonna paint that one unit. absolutely yes i have some core things that are very fundamental to how i play great joy that i'm going to use all the time but uh, yeah, I want to get another unit of maybe some Reapers painted or a different uh, commander or something like that. Get them Manders. <laughs> the Manders. All right. But yeah, yeah I'm, this I'm, looks I'm, good. I'm gaining on you, dude. Yeah, you. What do you got? Two. You got two painted. I have Night Lords. I have Boner Boys. I have Soul Blights. I have. I mean, I have a two thousand. You have a painted army of Soul Blight. Yeah. Don't lie to me. Yeah, it's painted. I have two thousand points painted. Don't lie to me. I don't have any. Mortarks painted. Mm. That's that's the big thing. The big thing. The big thing. I also have I have two thousand points of painted uh, Death Guard as well. So there's that. Oh, nice. Did you see the freaking reveal of the Night Lords uh, kill team box, bro? Oh, I don't. I don't think it pissed me off. Is they look like squatty boys? I want those to be more like primary sized chaos dudes. I want them. They look ripped. Small? They look small. Okay. With an O. I did see them. They looked awesome. And I was especially excited because there was a rumor going on that it was going to be a Kill Team box that was Night Lords versus Dark Eldar Mandrakes. And I was oh. like, dude, show me some new Mandrakes. Oh, but that's kind of like bad versus bad. You ain't they going to do that. Yeah, you're, maybe, probably, you're probably right. Maybe for a Kill Team supplemental two-player kind of box, maybe they would. Yeah. But, like, they can't. I mean, they did do, uh, what was it? Oh, the, they did Chaos and the Corsairs. That's not that's true. Bad. It's not bad on bad. It's like bad on like anti hero, but like that's not that's not a space marine. Yeah, uh, they did Death Corps Krieg and orcs. Yeah. 
but Deathcore Krieg are good guys. Good guys, yeah. I mean, they don't look like good guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, they but don't. But that's, that's, that's Games Workshop in a nutshell. It's like, how do we make all our, even our good guys look kind of like bad guys? Make them look like Nazis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're Nazi white people. That means they're, uh, I'm rooting for the orcs, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So that is all what we painted. That's all we painted. And let's just do a quick snack review. Oh, snack review. Uh, so I, I have some chips here uh, that I'm having everyone try. Um, they are uh, from the Chinese grocer, and they are beer and white peach flavored Lay's chips. The fuck are you yeah, saying? So that's why I want. I assume they were gonna have shrimp in them because they're from the Chinese grocery store. <laughs> Maybe they still do. <laughs> it's actually beer shrimp. Uh, so <laughs> the, the beer, the, the shrimp. All right, I'm gonna get a big women one. and live in beer. Oh god damn it! Here we go. go. This is beer and peaches. Beer and white peaches. So yeah, and let, let them let them do some of that crunching. Get that uh, the flavors all intermingled on your palate, and you can let me know. If you like these chips or not. That nasty boy. <laughs> that nasty. I can't taste beer at all. No, it's just shitty peach flavor. It's just right? shitty peach flavor over a salty chip. <laughs> and it is not good. It is, no, it's not good. You held you held up like your your straight face of like <laughs> not letting me think that this is gonna taste like complete ass. And it's like the back end flavor tastes like chemically fake peach yeah funk in the back of my, fr- yeah. my throat it's like a little bit of potato flavor in there from the chip and you kind of want to like eat more of the chip to like get the nasty peach flavor out of your mouth and then it just keeps getting worse and you're like what am i doing with my what, life what if i eat another one there's gonna be more peach in it <laughs> yeah everyone everyone who's eating that chip has disliked it um so yeah i, I appreciate you saving one for me then. <laughs> yeah we're, we're, i'm gonna throw it away when you leave <laughs> god damn it <laughs> I hate myself. Wow. Like, whose idea? There's not even, like, a peach on That's the my wife's idea. Bag. Oh. She bought that bag. Okay. And she was like... How did she know it was peach and, and beer? Because there's no peach on the thing, and it's all in Chinese. There, actually, that's a fantastic question. What? Maybe it was labeled on the shelf. Yeah, maybe it was. I, th- I swear to God, I saw white peach somewhere, but now I'm not seeing it, and there's, no, there's nowhere. It's nowhere. There's no image. There's nothing. I mean, they were smart to not put yeah, that as a the, highlight. The peach was definitely not the selling point. What the hey hey? I fucking don't know. It's weird. All right, so now now snack time is just turned into who can find the nastiest <laughs> shit to make the other person eat. <laughs> All right, it's going to exact vengeance on yeah, me. I'm gonna get like pee, like like <laughs> like fish guts, okay. like cherry cordials or some <laughs> shit. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, out of the main topic, I went to good old the 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 motherland, Europe, uh, and uh, had a fun experience there. And we're gonna talk about that. Okay, I'm ready for this. Are I have ready? so many questions because I, I I live kind of vicariously through through like the p- pictures you posted and stuff that uh, Roman had posted, and then other people that were over at Monty, and you you, you gave a couple of little little nuggets, but largely little you were nuggets. radio silent. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard. It's hard to film a video and also like do social media stuff at the same time. Yeah, it so is. I did some things. I struggled with that even like at Adepticon. Oh, like, yeah. oh, I haven't, I haven't turned my phone on for like two days to look even open up yeah. Instagram or whatever. Whoops. Um. So, I flew in on I think a Sunday, left seven days, seven p.m. Did a red light, uh, red eye, uh, f- uh, flight to Munich, Germany. Um. And there was nothing substantial about that that flight. It was fine. Um, and then I so I got to Munich, and there was a, what if that girl from the plane from dude, before would have been, been on the plane again? That would have been insane. That would have been the best story you could tell right now. Yeah, that would have been so crazy. That did not happen. It was okay. very uh, not noteworthy. Um, and there was a driver that Roman had scheduled to have me get picked up and he was going to have like a sign kind of like when we went to UK, there was a, Mm -hmm. a, a, I didn't see the sign. I didn't see anyone there. So I I had to call someone and then they ended up showing up um, at the airport, like where like the arrivals show up. And so I had to drive from Munich to Augsburg. It was like an hour drive on Google maps. And this driver was like the kind of guy who was like, he didn't speak English really. But he felt like if he spoke German more slowly that I would understand what he was saying. That checks out. That works. Yeah. And I, so we didn't converse at all. But this guy was 
tearing down the highway yeah at like 170 kilometers an hour oh baby so it was not an hour away it was it was close 18 minutes Dude, yeah <laughs> it was going fast and there was a guy chilling in the left lane and it was a two-lane highway and this guy honked on the horn and the guy got over and he flicked him off as he passed. And I was like, this guy fucking dude, rules, dude. I, dude. That's my fucking spirit animal, that guy right there. <laughs> yeah. Slow traffic, keep right, motherfucker. Stay yeah, dude, over. He, he had fucking places to be. Yeah. Uh, and that was hilarious. He got, he got paid by how much time he beat the estimated arrival time. <laughs> yeah, by. yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that, that's bonus pay for him. I mean, the best part about that is if he yells at him like, like in German while he's flicking him off. Because I just think that... The sound of someone angry yelling in German is the is the best yelling. <laughs> it's you pretty, know, it's pretty quality. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then I arrived at uh at Romans, um, and he was sitting out front. Uh, he's in like a he's in the kind of like a building, kind of like this. It's not an office building, but there are all kinds of uh, rooms you can rent out. And he was hanging out at the front steps, and you know we we finally met each other for the first time ever, and that was cool to actually meet him in person. And then I went up to the massive voodoo office space and he had uh, some presents there for me. I'm, I have some things to give to you that he gave me. Oh, no. Um, and it was like uh, it was stickers. It was a picture of his work. It was uh, I got this big Roman Lapot miniature art book. What? Yeah. And he like well, that's not miniature. It's regular size. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is really pretty. Nice oh, prints wow. of like a lot of his a lot of his works. Um I thought that was really cool. Like I, I've I've thought about uh, making a book like this before at some point, just because you know we paint a lot of models and they look really pretty, and it'd be cool to kind of put them in a nice like art book like this. Yeah. With a description when it was painted, who manufactures it, etc. Um, so this is a really nice gift. I appreciate this a lot. Um, and um, he also gave me this uh, this pretzel. Oh my God, that's and a soft pretzel right there. It was soft and it's it's split right down the middle. Uh, and he, and there's butter inside of it. And so what? it was, so it was crispy on the outside. It was soft on the inside and there was butter in it. And it was like so simple and so fucking beautiful. And like the, like the pastries were on point in Augsburg, Germany. They were oh, really hey. good. Uh, so that, so we started out eating that. Um, and then, uh, we kind of hung out and just chatted for a while. Uh, and then eventually, uh, his, uh, significant other can pick us up. Uh, because Roman like bikes back and forth to the office, and I didn't have a bike, um, and then we went back to his you place. Sh- you didn't like go sit on the front of the handlebars. No, 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 no that's later. That's later. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so yeah, then we uh, went back to his place, and then soon thereafter, it was like five or six. Went and had a traditional Bavarian dinner. Oh, uh, so I didn't know this. Uh, so I, Bavaria is southern Germany, mm-hmm. um, and. Bavarians are the ones that tend to care the most about things like Lederhosen and Oktoberfest. It isn't like a Germany-wide thing. Like, Berlin doesn't necessarily care as much about that. I didn't know that. Like, whenever, as an American, when you think about Germans, you're like, oh, you guys all love fucking beer and Oktoberfest, don't you? You feel that way? Yeah, because it's not a, in terms of size and land mass, it's not a massive country. No, yeah. So you just kind of assume uh, yeah, yeah but Most when you don't have Germany. a lot of land mass, I think you've seen that in like I see that in Eng- in England too, and oh I didn't gosh, realize yeah. that how not going very far from a distance can make a a big jump in in culture change, in accent and everything. Yeah, they're very regional. Yeah, yeah, which is I think it's pretty cool. I didn't know that either, but I it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, Yo, lo, lo. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, and then, so the what the Bavarian Bavarian meal was was it was schnitzel. I had I had a pork I had pork schnitzel that was like inspired by cordon bleu, and so it was like mm-hmm. filled with cheese and like ham and like breaded pork cutlet around the Come outside. Come on, that's, it was that's it was quality. Jesus, that sounds everything I love. That every word you said, I love. I know, dude. It oh. was it was good. So then you could you could get a side of fries or potato salad. I got potato salad. It was like a colder uh, potato salad that was kind of like more lemony and kind of like refreshing. Um, and, and that not, was not, not heavy mayo. Not heavy. And oh, it was it, it was kind of like soft potato, but like it was still like kind of chunky. But it wasn't like a mash. Um, but it was like you know when you like boil potato for like a decently long time and it kind of like starts to fall apart and get kind of. Yep, so yep, it was yep. it was like that lemony dilly salty kind of colder oh, so that was good with like the warm savory uh, schnitzel and then we got a salad bar and the salad bar was also great and it was so fucking cheap that's the really? thing like the food was so good it was so quality and it was so cheap um and also we got two i don't know if it was 
both of them were pints. But we've got two gigantic glasses of fucking beer. Das um, Boot? Was yeah. it in a boot? It wasn't in a boot, but oh. it was a giant glass fucking mug. And like I know when the when the waitress came around a second time, I heard her ask. I was like, you guys want another beer? And I was like, I don't really need it, but like, if you're going to get one, I'll, I'll definitely drink it with you. And he's like, your first day in Germany, you got to have at least two beers. And oh, so, yeah, <laughs> those are two German beers. Those are big beers. <laughs> yeah, they are fucking big, bro. I'm, they were big. I'm guessing the APV was not 6% on those either. I'm I don't know. They were pretty high. But I got pretty turnt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that helped a lot with jet lag, actually. Oh. I yeah. fell asleep pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like the food was was great, and I asked Roman another question. I was like, "Do you get like all the meat for this food from like from the village that we're in right now?" Because we were in a village outside of Augsburg, and when he said the word village, I was like, "Okay, there's like 300 people that live in this village." No, there's 7,000 or 8,000. Uh, so it's like a bigger village. There's not like thatch roof cottages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. there were solar panels on roofs, like. It, like there was definitely a, a, a an oldness to the village, but also a modernness. Like you get like a stipend in Germany for having solar panels on the roof from the government. So nice. a lot of them have them, and that was kind of interesting to see. So um, are we moving to Germany? Because everything you've said so far feels yeah. like I just want to pack up and go. Yeah, this is Amber's exact reaction. She was <laughs> like, "When are we moving?" Um, so the food was great. The little village that we were in has like it has like four buildings, you know, other than houses. It has uh, a grocery store, this restaurant. The police, uh, the police station, and maybe like a haircut salon, and that's it. Like everything else, they'd go to Augsburg to get. But like, I was so weird coming from America because like, there are three Starbucks in Roseville, Minnesota. Uh-huh. You know, there are three Starbucks in the Mall of Fucking America, bro. Yeah. So it's like it's all about like ease of access. Uh-huh. And but like there, it wasn't that way. It was just like well, at least in this one sim- single example. Um, so that was kind of interesting. But I also asked him, I was like, did you get the meat for this food or does the restaurant get the meat for this food from the village? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, so this is farm to table food, you know, yeah. which you would pay a, a fucking premium for in America. Um, mm-hmm. But not not there. Mm-hmm. They had a deer pasture. Like we have cow pastures. Mm-hmm. They had deers that they have for farming and eating. Hmm. That's kind of weird. Interesting. But they also have hunting is there as well. So, because yeah, this this is even more reason to move there. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 like all on scale, right? What's scalable? And the biggest thing with it, it feels like in America is, is everything has been pushed towards bigger cities, and then it's not scalable um, with so many people so close. Um, I mean, without factory farming anyway, like that's the path of least resistance, and that's what we've done. But it's really cool that that that's not where it has to be everywhere so. yeah that is yeah that's truly cool and, and probably a good observation about why that is the way it is a lot of people millions defeat. of people in germany too it's not like we're talking about you know middle of fucking nowhere yeah 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 um, Seven thousand people is a lot of people yeah maybe it works differently in like berlin and munich like i have no idea but yeah. that was the experience here in this small town and it was nice it was it was a, it was a pretty small town it looked it, there was awesome like walking paths and it looked cool and historic as well, so it was it was a nice little place to live for sure. Did, um, did you find many people spoke English there? No, uh, not not in his village. Uh, but I didn't have much exposure to people there. But like in that restaurant, like yeah, no one really spoke English. Okay. Um, okay, and so then we went home. It was like uh, we 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 had a, a pretty long dinner, so it was like nine at that point, and I was like super tired because I had like not slept at all on the airplane, mm-hmm. maybe for like. An hour. Oh, speaking of airplane movies, I watched uh, The Flash, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three, and I started to watch Renfield, and then the the the, the plane ride ended. Um, so that's what I watched. Did you finish Renfield? I did, but it was pretty fucking good. It's good. Yeah, dude. it's pretty it's good. good. I was enjoying that. I uh, I'm never really a fan of Guardians of the Galaxy, so that was pretty meh. The yeah. Flash exceeded my expectations, okay. uh, but it was still. I haven't watched The Flash. I watched Blue Beetle, and it's a, one of the worst fucking movies I've ever seen in my life. So. Yeah, they're really starting to lose the plot here, Marvel. <laughs> yeah, well, that's DC, which so oh, is Flash. Wait, Blue Beetle? Blue Beetle, DC, so is Flash. Wait, so. hold on. The Flash is DC, that's yeah. for sure, but Blue Beetle's not Marvel, dude? No. All right, what are you willing to it, bet? It, what are you willing to bet? It feels really, um, it feels, I'm almost positive it's, you, I mean, you've watched the fucking movie, you gotta be right. I mean, I, I'm not confident at all now. I'm more, I, I, I'm just confused because I thought it was Marvel, I, I was so convinced of this. It feels very Marvelized, it feels mm. like it's in their, their universe, like they're trying to trick you. Well, why is this so hard to figure out? Yeah, like. I think it's DC, I think you're right, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, anyway, about Germany and the Blue Beetle. Um, <laughs> 
So then the next day you, you got to it. So you you decided you're not were you actually not trying to sleep. So then when you'd get there, you, when you got to evening time there, you would be tired. That's, yes, that's, yes. A, that's a good good route. And I'm a creature, you know. I don't need to sleep. Uh, so that that worked for me. So I went to bed. And I woke up at three in the morning, and it was it was so bizarre. And I was like, okay, this is what jet lag feels like, because like at three there, it was uh, um, well, that didn't make any sense. I don't know why I woke up at three. I shouldn't have woke would up. Would have still three. been evening time. Yeah, it would have been evening time. Uh, so I woke up at three a.m. and I was like, I'm fucking ready to rip right now, and I could not, I could not fall back asleep until uh, like six a.m. Um, and so that was super annoying. Um, but then I did. I fell asleep with my phone in my fucking hand setting my alarm because I, I had set an <laughs> alarm for seven originally and i was like i'm not gonna sleep for another hour because i wanted to wake up and i had to do some thumbnail shit for this video the, the, the mm. board game video that i hadn't released at this point or like maybe answer a couple of emails um and i fell asleep with my phone in my hand and we were gonna leave from the house at 9 30 to go and be at his studio at 10 and i woke up at nine with my phone in my hand i'm like oh fuck i i, I fell asleep and so I ran upstairs, did a little shao shao, and then we rode bikes <laughs> to his studio. Hey, you want to ride bikes? It felt yeah. very fucking European. I loved it. Uh, I was there. Like honestly, like whenever I do a thing like this, like I don't really have an opinion about anything that that uh, I want to do. Like I want like the full like experience. Like mm -hmm. whatever. If Roman rides a bike every single day to the studio, I want to ride a bike to the studio. Like that, that's kind of what I was there for. Like I don't really care about food. Like Whatever is like the most Germanic Bavarian thing, that's what I want. Like I just want to, I want to experience it all for, for what it has to offer. Um, you should have told him you don't know how to ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was okay there, and so that that was that was cool. So we, we rode bikes to the grocery store. We got more delicious pastries. Uh, rode to the studio, ate some food, and then we got into painting. And for the first for for both days, we painted. Like ten to twelve hours, like somewhere in there. Okay. So, like, so this also involves like the education portion as well. Um, and so on day one, I got a little folder down here. Oh god, your homeworks. I know it. Like so, got grades on them. The, 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 so obviously, the thing I was one of the things I was really impressed by was that like obviously Romans taught a lot of people, and um, we always talk about how there's a difference between a painter who's good and a painter who knows how to educate, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not the same skill. They're, they're, they're different skills. Mm -hmm. And Roman certainly has got the chops to paint well, but he also he's clearly an educator. Like he clearly knows what he's doing from like the layout to like how like he's saving the materials for me from the class that he was writing on, taking notes on, mm -hmm. and like all this stuff. It was very considerate. Um, and like, I have all these things that I can like, uh, look back to. And like, these were all slides that we went through on his laptop. So like he, would ha he had a presentation for it, but he also, uh, has like the physical handout as well. Um, so like the whole layout of the class was very like thought out and like that, I could feel that. And that was great. That's great. Yeah. Um, I did the, uh, the, the first thing we did, I don't, I don't know like how specific I want to be about like what was taught in the class. Uh, but basically, we started out on day one. Day one was largely about color theory. Um, and so we we began with a, a CMYK color wheel, mostly just CMY. And we mixed uh, secondaries and uh, tertiaries from that uh, and talked about some interesting things that I didn't know about prior. Um, one, a chromatic gray is a gray that is blended from both cyan, magenta, and uh, yellow. Okay. And it creates this gray that is different than a neutral gray. Have you seen the, the phrase neutral gray before? Mm -hmm. Neutral gray is just white and black, black mixed together. And when you take neutral gray and you mix it into a color, it desaturates it very quickly. Yeah. Uh, it it, it like kind of murders the saturation, but it's quick, it's fast. Whereas chromatic gray, and we tested this, um, it does it does it much more gently and much slower, which is like oh. really interesting. Interesting. And so the question I had immediately for him, I was like, does someone sell a tube paint of chromatic gray? It seems like an easy layup, right? Right. And he was like, no. And I was like, what? <laughs> it seems so bizarre why that wouldn't exist. Uh, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Maybe that that's seems a, like something is a, a, like an easy layup, especially for like a chimera that's working yeah, in yeah. pure pigment. Yeah, I was, I'm thinking about the miniature painting world. Like we make so many fucking paints. Like yeah. how has no one done this? Maybe someone's done it. Maybe it's someone's done it, you know? Who knows? Sure. Um, so that was a cool thing that I learned. Um, I also learned that the red that we got from mixing yellow and magenta it's supposed to give you red. Um, wasn't super great, and so he also put in like a very saturated red in that color wheel. And so 
people always talk about CMY versus RG. Oh, not RGB. RYB. Mm -hmm. RYG? What is the RY, RYB? Red, yellow, blue. Yes. Um, as being better than RYB. But both both colors or both wheels, at least in that sing singular experience, produce one color that was bad. RYB is not good at doing purple. It created a very muddy, nasty purple. Mm. But in the other world, it creates a great purple, but it doesn't make a great red. And so I don't know if, at least in that single experience, it didn't seem like either one was better, but they just had different options. Sure. Um, and so from there, after kind of uh, doing some mixing of, of that stuff, talking about chromatic grays and neutral grays, uh, the first ex assignment that I got was he gave me three rounds of paint and in each round there were three pots and I was supposed to color match the paints in each group uh, with my primaries. Okay. Um, and the, the, the more I went on with each group of three paints, the more challenging and nuanced it became. So at the very end I had, you know, like a, a warm brown, a greenish tan, uh, a whatever color that, that they're, they're very desaturated and slightly colored and uh, it's hard to tell exactly. And so I, uh, I had to do that and I went through all those rounds and that's what I think I, you probably saw that picture. Um, maybe it's part of the back. Um, there it is. So like I went around and we'll show a picture of this as well. Each swatch, like trying to get closer and closer to the color. I nailed it sometimes on right away. Other times I had to like add a little bit of purple, add a little bit of whatever. And that was really interesting. And one thing I learned that I think is common knowledge. Um, he, he asked me the question. He's like, why do you think that colors like sunny skin tone and Vallejo ice yellow are so special? Like why people use those so often. Do you know, you have any idea why I didn't have answer that question? Um, because they brighten the color while maintaining a level of warm saturation. You're totally right. How do they do that? By still keeping yellow in the mix is part of the highlight. Kind of, uh, to more specifically, According to Roman, they use fluorescent paint. So there's really? yellow and white, but also yellow fluo paint. And, really? it, and it creates this glow. And this this was further backed up when I talked about this with someone else at Monte San Savino, and they brought it up independently of me talking about it. And I was like, okay, maybe this is what's happening. It's interesting, right? Huh. Orange fluo, yellow fluo, whatever the fluo is that you're going to mix. If you wanted to make your own kind of paint like that, like – consider adding a little bit of that and it adds a little bit of a little bit of juice and at Monty when we were talking about it it was in the context of NMM you know like you get like that yellow haze of yeah it. people are like we mix fluo into the highlight color to get that haze oh. and I was like okay um so it was really interesting to hear that I had never heard that before um but but cool cool to learn wow wow and so then I did the classic, the classic wolf experiment. Yeah, paint, you know? the, paint the wolf. Paint the wolf. Um, you see this. Everyone is doing this um, at, at, at Roman's office. And this is, this is more of an extension of this same experiment here. You are, uh, you're trying to match colors. And the wolf is tough to paint, right? Because mm -hmm. it's got browns and tans and, and very subtle blues and subtle greens in the background. And so you're having to kind of like walk through each part of the model and figure out uh, what color is what and mix it and get it right. Um, there are a lot of little things that you might not notice if you're not paying attention, like the shadow cast by like the cold, like morning yeah. air it has a little bit of blue in his, his nose, yeah. things like that. Um, so that, that was the, the next part. Um, and then we started to get into uh, atmospheric painting and stuff like that. Um, and I think what we did was we base coated, I think maybe actually, I'm trying to remember if we actually painted a model on day. We surely painted a model on day one. Surely, surely. Um, I can't. I can't fully remember if we started to paint the model on day one. Um, I was painting fucking something. Well, were you do figuring out color scheme and stuff for your model? Yeah, that was definitely part of it. That was definitely part of it. Okay. Um, but I can't remember the ex the exact thing. But honestly, day one and day two of the lesson, they bled together because. We painted until nine or nine thirty, biked home. It was like a ten minute, fifteen minute bike ride. And I got back and then like I was like ready to go to bed. Um <laughs> and so I just went to sleep. Um or I like stayed up for a little bit and like watched YouTube videos and then fell asleep watching YouTube videos for like thirty minutes or whatever it was. And then I woke up and 
we just did it again. You know, we like went, we got pa- we got pastries and then did it again and came back and taught again. So for me, the, the, the two days bleed together quite a bit. Um, and um, it was, uh, you know, it felt like an educational experience, but also it felt like, uh, you know, VinciCon. Like we were just sure. hanging out and painting and chilling and that was a lot of fun. Chatting about this, that, and the other. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so I can't remember the exact layout of the days, but we came back then and started to do some some planning um, about like how we were going to paint our models um, and stuff like that. And so we looked through various concept arts, uh, talked about environmental painting and what that looks like, um, and started to plot out um, how we were going to paint our models. And so we did that by having very basic drawings of the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we started with was like a, a value sketch. So like, where do you want to put your dark elements, your bright elements and your medium, uh, like, uh, value elements and what does that look like? And so I tried a few different things and I think this is the one that I settled on. That one felt right to me. Yep. Um, and then from there we did the same thing with colors. We then took various colors and place them on the model following that value uh, layout. Okay, medium color there, dark color there, uh, light color for the skin. Um, and then we like mixed in um, environmental tones into this. So you picked an environmental color, like a mother color, um, something like that. Mm-hmm. And you mix that into every swash in your palette and you paint it again. Because it's hard to know what that environmental hue is going to do to the palette you select. Sure. And so you just you just did a little I did a little experiment to see, and I said that looks like fucking trash. Um, <laughs> so that 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 one didn't look great. The green one didn't look great. Uh, and then I did it, tried it again with more purpley and uh, sorry, more bluish, orangish hues. Um, and then I mixed in a purple environmental tone and got this, and that felt at least nicer to start from than this. That felt kind of more putrid and sickly. Um, and so then from then on, I base coated these tones in. And then began to highlight and paint how I painted. Um, and one thing that was really surprising to me is that uh, Roman, the impression that I get from his painting and how he how he works is that he's very slapdash. He's very haphazard. He's like kind of whatever, you know, he paints them all with his fingers. Who fucking cares, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but he was also very calculating as well. Like he was very particular about brush strokes. When you're base coating, he's like, if you're going to base coat, like, say, like the ghoul queen's long arm, right? You're going to start here and go down and then start here and go down and start here and go down. And you're never going to disturb those previous layers. Don't touch them because you're going to, st- if you start the very beginning by agitating, drying paint, like, say, if you did this run, this run, and you went back to that side and did that run, like, don't do that. Um, if you agitate paint at the very beginning of the paint job, You'll create texture. And then the more layers of paint you add, the more you're going to enunciate the texture. So it's very critical in the beginning to approach it more uh, cautiously. And I just, mm. I feel like that would, that's the kind of thing that I'd never hear from Roman Lapot. Uh-uh. Right? Um, and like, I, I don't care at all about that shit. Like, I am all over the place when I'm base coating and probably to a fault because I do get a lot of texture on my models. But I kind of feel like at the end of the day, I'm able to hide it with highlighting and blending and shading. Yeah. Do you feel that same way? Yeah. It makes me immediately self-conscious about how much I do that. I know. I know. How much am I touching the stuff that's I, I just placed five seconds ago? Right. Yeah. And I guess depending how thin the paint is and what kind of paint it is, it might dry, you know, it might dry in 10 seconds. You know, it might dry super fast. And so if you're touching that at all, even if it doesn't look like you're scraping it up, you're probably you know, moving around some cured pigment a little bit and getting a little bit of a texture, you know? Does he leave a, so talking the, the, the arm example. Yeah. Does he do one stroke from the shoulder down to the wrist and then he kind of leaves almost like a, a small white space between those? Yeah. So you don't accidentally, that brush stroke that's going parallel to it doesn't touch the other one? So I asked him about that because like, I, I get really specific. Like I, I want exam- I want examples and I want reasons for why he does things. And so I was constantly questioning him, um, which kind of, Tossed him a little bit off of his A game, uh, which was it was kind of funny, uh, but he said, "Yeah, like he, like he, if he did that in that case, her the Ghoul Queen's arm is very fucking long. Yeah. Um. So in that case, he would leave a little bit of a gap, uh, so he wasn't agitating that paint at the top of that brush stroke, um, which is interesting to me. And then uh, furthermore, say if you're if you're hiding that same arm, 
um, maybe there's a high that runs down the center of the arm, right? Mm -hmm. um, instead of brushing a line down the middle and then saying, trying to glaze that transition or do it, he would brush toward the middle of the arm from the sides using the side of the brush because the side of the brush applies paint more softly than the tip does. Yeah. And obviously there's that trick of where you lift the brush off of where most paint deposits. And so like he was very calculated about how in what direction he was applying his brush strokes. Whereas me, the, the mechanics of what I'm doing aren't important as long as like the vision of what I have in my brain is, is starting to happen. Like I don't really care about how I get there so much, mm -hmm. but he cares how he get, how he gets there. So huh. that was kind of interesting. It probably, that probably melds really well with the philosophy of having a devil may care attitude because it's that you can be more devil may care when you're think, when you're, um, consistency in those small details are almost like subconscious he's not having to think through that but he's using the correct techniques the whole time so he can focus on bigger picture stuff and, and that kind of thing instead of that minute stuff but it's really weird that it's like the foundation is in very calculated ways which is not again not how i see him working that's right. not what i would have guessed at all yeah huh that's it's interesting cool. it's very interesting um, he painted an academic bust, which uh, in hindsight, I wish I had brought an academic bust. Um, so if, if you guys ever take a private coaching or even a, a class and the, there's an option to bring the model that you want to paint, Roman and I didn't paint the same model. I mean, it didn't matter, honestly. Um, you should bring an academic, in, in, sorry, in the, in, you have to bring a bust. Bring an academic bust because they're smaller and you can get through the model much faster and get onto the good stuff. Uh, because my model was so large, um, and we spent time base coating the whole model in the beginning with a paintbrush. It took a long time. It was another way that Roman paints is different than I. Um, he base coats everything, highlights everything once, highlights everything twice. And then at the very end, I think he called it like fireworks. It's like everything comes together in a very satisfying way. Um, and, uh, and like that's not how I paint. Like I, I need little treats along the way. Yeah, you, <laughs> your small victories to yeah, get you to yeah. the next one. And so at a certain point, I was like, you know, Roman, we're not gonna finish this model. I, I, I didn't expect to. That's totally fine. I would love to just work on the face. And, and he's like, yeah, that's totally fine. Let's do that. And so then from then on, I kind of just worked on on her face and and made that nice and cool. I um, see the value. I see both sides of this coin. I see the value of what he's talking about because it allows you to make those tweaks in how much you push the light or you push the intensity of, of highlights or whatever because you're seeing the whole picture in in short steps. Yeah. And that, that makes it probably much easier to make confident decisions on the next step up. Um, however, you have to have a level of confident, confidence slash experience to know that you're getting, you're eventually going to get to the fireworks and not like, well, I got to the end and here's like, something's not right. Because <laughs> you second guess yourself when you're like, I, I got the the bracers all the way up to complete and they look really good, right? Because yeah. I, I know they look good, but like, the way if I'm doing it all together, I don't know if it's all going to turn out good. Right. You have to have to trust the process maybe a bit more. I, I And I totally agree with that. I do think the right way to paint is to paint the whole thing up at the same time yeah i'm just mentally weak and yeah. i can't do that <laughs> like i need i need the nice encouragement from oh i do know how to paint that is right <laughs> yes, okay yes. on to the next part yeah. you know because obviously you have the ass phase of the model right and that's that lasts, a real long ass it lasts that? a long time yeah. yeah i need to i need to re remind myself that i am not a, a trash painter <laughs> also there's an aspect of this that I, I will not hide from the goody peepees, and that is if you're constantly painting a different thing up one more step, you're going to have to remix your paints for those so goddamn much because you're not just like, okay, the next highlight for the bracer, and then the next highlight for the bracer, and then the glaze down for the shadow. All the colors are already there, are already wet, are already working with, already fresh in my mind. What was the mix? <laughs> if I'm doing bracer, then skin, then dress, then armor, then whatever, it's like, Oh, fuck. I'm going to have to remix color so much. It feels so inefficient from a time perspective. You're totally right. And I also felt that way. It's like, and also the thing about mixing paint is that the more you mix it, the more it spreads out. And the more it spreads out, the faster it dries. Yeah. Because it's more surface area. Yep. And so it's just like, 
so Roman had, and he gave me one as well, that giant ass Masterson wet palette. Oh God, it's like a waterbed size. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. And yes, he did use it all. Uh, and he actually did really cool things with the, he, use, he uses the paper uh, that comes with the wet palette. And he, he boils it like you're supposed to. Uh, to open up the pores, Jeez, and, and he said he uses it, and I was like, I, I was like, I know you have to boil it. I've used it, and I don't like it. And like, it's not my preference. But we used it for his class. Um, but he also can he draws on it, so he like sections out his wet palette. Um, Wild. I know. It's. See, I was just like, this is so interesting, and not at all what I expected. Wait. So does he draw on it before he puts it onto the palette and get it gets it wet? He did it when it was wet, cause fuck it, dude. dude Jesus Christ. Man. Jesus Christ. I guess maybe some of that that thick ass mattress pad paper that they use. <laughs> Is uh is great for that. I mean that's that's smart though. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't, you know, there are things I want to say, but I also don't want to like, like ruin the educational experience for like future people. So I'll just share. I'll share a little bit about the uh, environmental uh, painting. Um, basically, what we were doing was <laughs> this idea of of mother color, which actually is a term that he does not like very much. I, apparently, Vince took this class that I was learning the same curriculum from and he, 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 he called it like environmental color or something, something like that. I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And he, I think, I think in passing he mentioned the mother color and he's like, but he doesn't like this term. And then I think he said, Vince just kind of ran with that term and then like made uh -huh. a video about it and shit. Uh, I don't know. That's the, the, the whole truth, but it, it's a similar concept where it's like, I have a, in my case, my environmental color for my shadow was, was purple. Mm -hmm. uh, a dark purple and my environmental color for my highlight was yellow and so in this case i just mixed uh um my highlight colors with my highlight color and then i mixed my shadow color with my shadow colors every every paint in my scheme got that mixed in uh those two different colors and so the question that i had was like okay well sometimes you get this interaction where like say you have um a shadow color and a highlight color that when they interact like a, a blue shadow and a yellow highlight they make a green mint a green midtone. Like, how do you get that that color to happen? Because if you're mixing independently, you're not going to get that that natural mixing of blue and yellow if they're if they're separate. And what he does to solve that small problem is he'll take some green in an airbrush and he'll glaze that green color into the midtone to get that subtle mixing of lights. Um, hmm. Does that make sense? It does. It does make sense. Okay. It's the bridge. He's building that bridge between those. Right. Sure. Right. And, um, and so I took notes while we were, were while we were uh, discussing things. Um, and I think the the last thing I'll say about the class are my my overarching thoughts about it, and also some of those notes that I took. Um, so when doing this kind of painting with environmental painting, it's very important that you start from a saturated place, right? Mm -hmm. If your midtones have any amount of white, gray, or black in them, and you mix this shadow color, which certainly has black in it into it you really start to muddy the color super fast yeah. and so starting from a saturated places both both uh mixing in the highlights and for shadows is very important and then the other things are in a notebook that are not on me right now <laughs> <laughs> one second all right we're back scott found his notebook i took a pee and i had this moment of standing in the bathroom and looking at the mirror <laughs> realizing we were talking about like this a uh, uh, a village in Germany and like homemade schnitzel and fresh pastries and I'm wearing a fucking Costco wholesale <laughs> sweatshirt the most american opposite thing to your experience okay yeah. go ahead yeah yeah <laughs> so okay here's a note that is related to a previous point they were talking about like he's very intentional with his brush strokes right we talk a lot about futzing and the correctional stage of painting and blending yeah and and so I wrote a note here. I was like, maybe if I was more intentional with the direction of my brush strokes, I would I would have to futz, futz less, but I would just spend more time in the beginning, but hopefully less time overall. Yeah. You know? And so so about that, he had a lot of sketches where you've ever seen you've you've done sketching. You know like your volume lines, yep. right? Yep. And so we'll we'll have a picture of this as well. I'll take a picture and send it to our editor. So if you ever have a circle, you can have the circle facing up, facing down. It's like someone's head, right? Mm -hmm. And so when Roman paints, he paints with the volume lines. And so if he were painting this highlight, he would paint up and curve toward the top. Or like or like if he was painting a highlight from the side to the side, he would go whoo, whoo. You know, he would he would think about it in that way to build up that volume in the direction that he wants it to go to imply its movement and stuff like that. So it's very it's 2D thinking, right? Yeah. Yep. 
And so if I thought more about that, I've never thought about this specifically. Um, I'd have less shit to do. Uh, and then the last note I had is about a potential future topic for us that to discuss, if you want to discuss it, because we talked about it so much, um, about mini painting, how inward looking it is. So uh, when you when you go to a mini painting show, everyone at the show is a mini painter, right? And they are enjoying the beautiful art of the mini painting thing. When you go to a museum, most people aren't also creators of the art they're enjoying. They're just yeah. enjoying the art, right? Yep. So it's a very interesting comparison between the hobby world and the art world, which honestly, this is a whole conversation that I, uh, I would love to have with you. Mm -hmm. we, we discussed it for like hours uh, at a, in Monte San Savino. And that, that was just one part of it, is how the two differ. But that was kind of an interesting observation. It is. It is very incestuous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to fucking put it that way. Yeah. Um, so that that was it for the educational experience. And Roman did a couple of demos that I brought or that he actually gave me that I didn't know he did. that I'm going to show you and talk about. But before we do that, any questions about that? Are you all good? No, I I'm I'm good. I a lot of the stuff that you're saying there is. I, I could totally see that it makes sense in understanding roman style and how he approaches things um i really i really like where it seems very thoughtful and purposeful of you started in an area that is quite removed from miniature painting yes and you got to miniature painting a quarter step at a time yeah and each thing got you closer to where you were ending up and it was each one of those seemed like a purposeful step so in terms of the educator side and you know from the visuals and everything you have there and what you're saying it's like well yeah, he takes this um very seriously super seriously yeah. yeah which is an awesome awesome thing yeah like my general thoughts about the whole thing were it's been a very long time since i've invested anything any amount of time energy money um and this is a free coaching but i had to pay to go there but like any amount of investment in my own miniature education, you know, mm. I have painted how I want to paint for a super long time. Um, and that's fine and it's comfortable and it's easy, but it's also good just to try to see someone else's approach to the hobby and how to best absorb that information into your process and how, how it can in fact, uh, impact you positively. And so, that's what I'm trying to figure out now. I'm trying to think about how these how these little tidbits and advice that I got. And I'm going to review the the curriculum a little bit and see what's what's best for me and what's going to work out for me. Um, and that's just cool, you know. I, I haven't done that in a long time, so it feels good to to actually do that. You know, back in the day when like you were watching a lot of YouTube videos, trying to figure out what the fuck wet blending is and how it works for you and like when you're going to use it. Like, you kind of yeah. You, I'm not doing that so much lately. No, I I feel you there. I'm. And a lot of the things that we learn, whether it's when you, if you take a class at a convention or you are trying to figure out a thing through YouTube or whatever, um, are very compartmentalized. Yeah, yeah. Like you're just doing a thing, but understanding the how it fits into the whole, and the whole is more important than the little silos of skills and techniques. Um, which is what uh, uh, that time with him, uh, two full days feels a little bit more like all encompassing is, it seems much more valuable than it's very important at the beginning to get those bite sized things. But like pulling them all together is not just a matter of, I have these five skills. I just do them all on this one paint job. It's not quite that way. And I think that's something that I feel like I definitely have room to, to grow a lot more on and seeing the connections before I start step one, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. You know that that's something that I feel like I have, I don't have a, a, as great a grasp on as I I'd like to. Yeah, and that's the the way you said that is exactly how it was meant to be laid out. It's like he was like, we're gonna start with foundational knowledge, and then it's going to be repeatedly used over and over again. Uh, so it was really well thought out. Um, and that's the other thing that I want to say about the the course is that there there was a lot of theoretical knowledge in the course and also combined with it practical application of those ideas and i was just like and i had a lot of questions and i was like you know you do this thing a certain way why do you do it i think this way is better and he would explain it and it was reasonable and so you know there are people like gordon ramsay that will tell you to cook meat a certain way because of this thing and it's like you are lying that is actually not how that thing actually works <laughs> it's like it's like people like that have 
skills that they've built up through repetition over and over and over again. And they don't know why they do the things they do it. And they do work, but they don't know why they're doing it. And so I always appreciated that when I asked, why are you doing this thing? Uh, I wasn't just asking just to test him. I was asking because I felt like he was, I didn't get why he was doing it. He always had a compelling answer. And so it was like, I just appreciated that there was, there was theory and practicality. Nice. It was great. It was great. Okay. And then demos. He painted a zombie for me in 15 minutes um, that, uh, that used the idea of an environmental highlight and shadow color. And I, I timed him in everything. So just, uh, that was pretty cool. I mean, that yeah. for 15 minutes, like that's, Totally fucking fine. Yeah, that's more than fine. Yeah. So, shadow color was like a like a rusty purplish brown kind of a thing. Yeah, uh, definitely a purple for the shadow. It was yeah. a sunset purple from Scale Seventy Five, which is a very it's not a very it's kind of a warmer purple. But uh, like he has a, a video. He has a video, I believe, of this process on his YouTube channel. Oh. Um, if you want to check it out, it's, it's either that or this thing I'm about to show you next. So we can we can link that below. Um, it's uh so you can see the process for yourself. Yeah, and then like a like a sky blue. I actually can't remember what the highlight, highlight color was. I'm just looking at the highest highlights on the white shirt, mm. which this dude is wearing like a white wife beater shirt, and there's no pure white on. Yeah, it. yeah. There's yeah. It's largely it's largely purple color, but because yeah. there's purple color everywhere else in the model, it doesn't feel like it doesn't belong. Yes, and the points where it's gone up to almost is, I'm guessing is pure like sky blue. Um, then it tells your eye it is it is blue. Yeah, it's bizarre. Or white, sorry. Yeah, because like in, in the past, I would be like, okay, I can paint white with any shadow color I want. And while that is kind of true, it's like if I had that shirt in a different model where everything was shaded with different colors, that wouldn't look white anymore. Mm -hmm. Because the other elements of the that 15-minute paint job allow the white to be pink and it still read as white because the other things support that idea. You start with the mi He starts with the mid-tone that doesn't include any of the added shadow or highlight color. Not on this model. On this model, he uh, normally yes. Uh, he doused the whole model. Um, sorry, Ro Roman paints shadow to highlight. So he starts with his his darkest, most colored shadow. Okay. Uh, with a little bit, a little bit of midtone mixed in. Um, on this model, he doused the whole thing in purple, and then just wet blended everything on top of it. Uh, okay. Well, so that there was no consideration for brush strokes on this thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, very very cool. But yeah, did I did I explain that? Did that make sense? Yes. Okay, yes, that made sense. And the last demo he did was another fifteen minute paint job of this little face. I don't think he did the he didn't finish the eyes, but this is also there's a video of this on his channel. I see you fucking fluo in there now that you told me there's fluo. <laughs> the, yeah, well, maybe it's a little bit different here. This was super cool how he did this. He started the face. You know how like the face has zones of color you heard yeah. before. Yep. So for people who haven't heard of this, there's a yellow band on the top third. In the middle third, there's a red band, and on the lower third of the face, there's a blue band. And there's reasons for all of these things. But he got this face, and he painted with watercolor. First of all, he painted the whole face in green. Mm. And then he painted with watercolor those three bands. Okay. Yellow, Zones. red, blue. And then he painted on top of all of those things, the green undercoat and the, the, the watercolor, with normal acrylic paint that was Caucasian skin tone. And the water in the paint reactivated the water in the uh, uh, watercolor paint and it mixed on the model to get those rosy cheeks, <laughs> that yellowy highlight on the forehead, that blue five o'clock shadow on the bottom. And then once the paint dries, it's all locked in because the, the acrylic mm -hmm. binder locks it all in. And that's a really interesting way to get a multicolor wet blend where time is not pressuring you, at least, right. at least in the very beginning application of the color. Yes. You could use that for all kinds of shit. Yeah. Not, not just faces. Right. That could be a cloak thing. That could be a that could be a, a thing on an individual armor panel thing. Like you could that, that's such a an so, interesting idea. So he did he didn't wait for the watercolor to dry to I start mean, he working. did, but who cares if it dries? Sure, because it would reactivates for the water from the acrylic paint. Exactly. Oh, damn. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh I mean it doesn't look amazing. It's a fifteen minute head, but like that that idea There's so much depth of color in it for 15 minutes yeah 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 there's so many different there's a green still there's the caucasian there's the red there's the blue in the skin there's a yellow in the skin there's a lot going on um for 15 minutes that's wild so that was cool he did those two on the very last day right before we headed out to monte san Savino the next morning okay 
which leads us to the next uh, ring of your trip, which is going to Monte Sansovino, often regarded as the most prestigious miniature painting competition in the world. Yeah, definitely like, like yeah, high quality of models there for sure. My first question, how many people are attend that? It didn't look like there was a lot of people there. It's hard to tell those because the rooms are kind of small and they feel packed. Mm -hmm. If I had to guess, I would say no more than well, I don't want to be wrong. No more than 400, no more than 500. Okay. Like, like maybe a thousand, but definitely not more than a thousand. Okay. It's got, it's got to be like 500, 600, something like that. Okay. But I don't know if they don't really keep track of that because you don't need to buy anything to look at the models. You only need to buy something to enter. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that next morning, me, uh, me and Roman and uh, Hawkins Miniature Art, Johannes, uh, we drove to... If you, I showed you in a previous episode in our extended portion, we share models that we love from other painters. I don't know if you remember this, but I showed you a sick-ass Mordheim diorama once upon a time. Uh -huh. And that was Hawking Miniature Arts diorama. Where, where With the carriage looks... crashed and shit. Oh, remember that? Yes. Yeah. So he's got a cool diorama going for that. Uh, and we drove together to uh, Italy, and that was about a nine-hour drive like through the Alps. Cool. Um, and I don't know why I thought this, but when someone said through the Alps, I thought there was going to be tons of winding roads and we're going to go up and down mountains. But there's a pretty nice path through the valley of uh, the Alps, just kind of to to Italy. It wasn't like a ton of turning and shit. Makes sense that the road builders weren't just like, let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's get crazy. Yeah. Uh, but it was cool. It was still cool because like it snowed at one point and there were like castles embedded in the mountains. Oh, God. There was like five castles just like as we drove by just on this major highway. Uh, so that was, it was fucking cool to see that shit. Oh, man. Castles. Oh, man. So then it was a two day thing that you're a Monty for or one day, one and a half. So we got there, we got, got to Monty and it was like nine, 10 PM. And so then we just immediately uh, went to sleep and then woke up. And then I think it was Thursday. So nothing happened on Sunday, then Monday, Tuesday, then Wednesday was driving. Yeah. So that was Thursday. So I was at Monty for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I left Sunday morning at 7 AM. So it was yeah. three days of Monty Santa, wow. you know, that's a lot. It was a lot for a first time, honestly. Uh, and honestly, I got some flack for not staying for that last day as well, the award ceremony, because it's something, apparently it's something special, uh, where it happens and, and stuff like that. I saw the pictures of, like, it looks like some kind of, like, a, a theater almost. Yeah, space. yeah. yeah. Looks like the Muppet Theater where they had those little things yeah. up top where the two <laughs> old guys. Someone else said that, too, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah. Day one, we, uh, we, first of all, on the car ride, we had so many fucking like Roman bought so many miniatures because he wasn't competing. He was exhibiting many pieces of art. And so we're driving this Volkswagen sedan and there's, I'm sitting in the back seat and like two thirds of the whole back seat are all fucking models and they're all fucking Roman's models. Uh, so it was, uh, it was cramped in our little European car. <laughs> uh, but then we, day one, we got there. Uh, we actually were staying next to people who were we actually hung out with a couple more times that were uh, one of them was uh, a fan of the podcast his name was Tobias they were uh, Danish people um, and so it was interesting we, we immediately got there and someone like recognized uh, me for the podcast specifically and was like hey you want to get a beer but like we had been like driving all day long and it was like 10, 10 p.m. so we went to bed woke up went to the event with all of our boxes of stuff because we had to, you know, go sign in, we had to sign like in and enter all that stuff. And, uh, right away I had met people that knew me from my channel. I had uh, people were there that were at Depticon as well. Wow. Uh, someone was there that you might've met at, uh, Nova open. The guy who won best in show. Oh, uh, uh Tibol, Tibol, Tibol. Uh, uh, yeah, he was there. Me and him talked a lot. But uh, cool. he's a really nice dude. He's a really nice dude. Him and him and all of his uh, his French compatriots were super chill for being French. Yeah, he's really yeah. Nice. <laughs> wrecked. Uh, but that was nice. Um, he brought me immediately on day one. He brought me uh, a nice slab of cheese. <laughs> Are you going to say like a bag of shrooms? <laughs> <laughs> I, like, fucking, I fucking <laughs> wish, dude. Holy shit. That would have been amazing. He just has pocket cheese. He just fucking <laughs> hands you up cheese. Pocket <laughs> cheese? Like these uh, uh, pr praline kind of candy things that I haven't got a chance to eat yet. I got a chance to eat the cheese. Cheese is great. Nice. And he also gave me a little pastry, like kind of a squishy, chewier bread. 
pastry thing. He gave one to Valbjorn too. It had a name. I can't remember the name, but that was also very good. So this guy shows up with three items of food. Uh, it, he, you know, he's French. It makes sense. Yeah. It was good. You know, it tasted good. I loved that. Yeah, it was great. We went out to eat. To, um, he had this look on his face <laughs> about when we were eating stuff, and uh, I kept I kept asking him about the food and what his thoughts were yeah. because I could tell. He was being polite, like a polite Frenchman, but he was still a Frenchman. So underneath, just underneath the just facade, I, he was just, and so I, just, I would just keep poking him about <laughs> questions about the food, about what specifically what he was eating yeah. and what he liked and didn't like. Yeah, He's yeah. Like, oh, you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't ask me these things. <laughs> <laughs> He's a really nice dude. He's also in the Magic the Gathering a lot. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. All right, Well, if you come next year, we're going to play. I'm going to throw down. Uh, did you get to see his Eldar stuff? Uh, yes, I did. I got to see that. It was, uh, I think it was in the master category. Um, that bust is so hot. Yeah, it's good. It's good shit. It was actually, it was in a different building. Um, so it's interesting how it's laid out. So obviously it's a historic European town. Monte means mountain. So this is a mountainous Italian village. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, when you, it's really cool. Like, like Monte Cristo. Kind of. So Count of Monte Cristo is just it was on the mountain. The okay. Count of M- Mountain Mountain Cristo. Yeah. <laughs> Mount <laughs> Cristo. Mount Cristo. Uh, so when you walk in, there's like this really cool pavilion area where the sun is shining down, and you have two twin staircases that go up to this 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 room. And then when you go in there, you can break left and right. And there are two rooms that are the exact same rectangular shape. And on both sides of the rectangle, actually on uh, on, on three of the sides, there are tables for, for models. Mm-hmm. And they're fully open. There's no glass. So you, you walk in. You do a little sign-up thing. Um, and then you go and you put your model in, the, in, in whatever space you want. And they might move it around to make space for stuff. But in the, in the master fantasy painting category alone, there were over 900 fucking entries. Oh my god! It was insane. I, I I wish I wish I had numbers for like how many entries there were total in each category, how many awarded medals there were. They don't really publish that information anywhere, and I I didn't ask, but I feel like they probably wouldn't have got back to me in time for the episode if I did. Anyways, Francisco's got to know. Yeah, he probably yeah he's got to know, or or the judges. The judges also know. Yeah. Um, but there was. There was a lot. There was a lot of models to look at. Um, but you can enter as many as you want. Yes, you can. Um, so those were the first two main rooms where models are typically. And in one room, so the way the categories worked was there was fantasy painting master and fantasy painting standard. And what fantasy painting is, is it's a fantasy subject, and the important part of the art piece is the painting. That's what they want you to look at. Okay. And then there's storytelling standard and storytelling master, which this is more about uh, the, the story, the narrative of the piece. Dioramas want to go here, right? Yeah. In standard and man- uh, sorry, standard and master, it's probably obvious. Those are just like your skill levels or your experience levels, um, where you're going to put your model um, based on a self-diagnosis. And if you're too low, the judges will move you up. If you're too high, they will not move you down. That's that's what mm-hmm. I heard. Uh, I, I you know none of this is really written down anywhere, so I don't. I could be wrong, but that's what, that's what I was told. Um, it feels very Italian. Yeah. It's like, it's because you just go. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's also fantasy storytelling standard and mastered. And this is where you have a, not a, not a whole ass diorama, but a single fantasy piece that's more storytelling driven and less painting driven. So there's, there aren't typical categories like bust, single fig sci-fi, single fig fantasy. Like there, there isn't that kind of stuff. It was more about like, what is the point of the piece you're putting it in? Are you showing off a cool narrative? Or are you showing off, a, are you showing off like really high technique, technique painting? Then it goes here. And there are also categories for sculpting. There was a cow category where like you had to, like they, you, they released cow? A, a cow model and you had to paint the cow in a certain amount of time. And then there was a whole category for that. For the cow. For the cow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I see. I don't think I saw a single fucking cow. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like I, you know, I looked kind of a lot, so I don't know how I couldn't see it. But yeah, I, I didn't see one. Uh, but there were the, the categories are very different than anything I've ever experienced or know of. You know, it Maybe wasn't well, sculpting as a category too. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so the sculpting stuff. So it was basically oh, an historical, historical standard, historical master. So in in one room there was. Historical master and like 
fantasy standard and in the other room there was historical standard and fantasy master and so they had the rooms had a, a nice mixture mm-hmm. of standard and master so it wasn't like master was all in one room and got super busy and standard wasn't super busy and shit like that um so that was that was interesting and then beyond those two rooms there was a side church that had roman's exhibit pieces in it um the sculpting category as well as just pieces of note like really important pieces like alberto i saw albert moreto fonts pieces were in there um like really nicely painted shit which that was so fucking cool to get to see those pieces in real life i think they're the only pieces that i've ever seen that stand up to the photo like really no difference wow in my opinion um like they were incredible he brought his big dwarf Mm -hmm. and his smaller elf piece Uh little uh Little little tea here. One of the judges broke his elf piece. Oh, yeah. Why are even judges even touching it? They're just a display. Because they, I think they have to decide as a group who is going to win like best in show and shit. And they do that by like by voting. It's like okay, which of these? So you have a group of five models. Everyone has to pick two. Okay, now we have the last two. Okay, now everyone's got to pick a group of one. And in like in, in shuffling around the models in groups, like once they like you know figured out which ones remained, they would like move a piece back to the shelf or move it out into a group. And so I think that's why they're getting touched, but also they got touched a lot for saving on space. Like my pieces moved around three fucking times, two times, two times. Yeah. They had three resting spots. Um, now there's a huge fear of people like running into shit and breaking the miles. Cause there's no, there's no, uh, uh window pane of glass. Mm-hmm. And it was a judge that broke <laughs> Albert's piece, but the judges that were, sorry, the people that were there, defending the models from the average viewer were on their fucking a game oh yeah they were like i walked in with a backpack on and they were like pick that thing off like because you don't know if you're gonna spin around and hit shit like i wasn't even spinning around at that point i just had it on and they're like take it off and like i got like i got i got a couple comments when i was like pointing at a model on row two or row three and i was kind of hanging over row one a little bit they're like they're like back away and so like i saw it happen to me other people like many times and so i really appreciated how on their game they were that's that's valuable i know information it it, it made me feel great about like putting my models there because i felt like they were gonna be be protected but there wasn't like a valet rope where you you could get close but not like i could get close i could get two inches away and they were okay with that as long as you weren't like overhangy. Yeah, but the problem is, is I wanted to get that close to models in row two and three. Yeah, you can't. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. So I couldn't get super close to Al- Al- Albert's pieces because they were they were like row three, top row. Um, but that was that was okay. So, um, I mean, what do I even say about this event? It was I. So that was kind of the layout. There were cool buildings. They were spread out a little bit. They were all very historic and beautiful. The point of this event, the whole point of this event is looking at beautiful models, getting inspired, and socializing. Mm-hmm. So I feel like you would shine oh. at this event. Because all it is about is, is about just painting and just chatting with people and having having a good time. Oh, that sounds pretty freaking amazing. It was it was it was so nice. So first of all, the models on display were amazing. They were they really take the medium of miniature art and stretch it creatively so much more than any event I've ever been to or seen models online for. Like, Mm. there's just so many fresh takes on the hobby. So many emotional takes. Like, I I got, like, sad looking at pieces. Like, there was a a piece of a diorama. So there was a diorama where the base of the piece was a cell phone with the screen removed, and you could see the the, the, the electronics below. And in the middle of it was a small African child with a mining he- uh, like headset on, holding out a hand of like what makes silicone, you know? Mm. And it's built in a fucking cell phone. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Uh, there was a piece about self-abuse, about self-harm uh, that, that was really uh, motivating as well. There was a piece about uh, Palestinian refugees being denied access to borders where it was like a, a chain link fence and like, and like poster cutouts like on the plinth itself saying things about like the conflict and a mother and a child behind the chain link fence. Um, so like there was, there was that, but also there were super creative things where it's like I have a story with my diorama and then I have paper comic book panels that have really good illustrations and like in really good comic book font that are like kind of attached to the backdrop of the diorama that are like the beginning of the story and like the diorama is like the result of that story 
I have a piece here picked for my favorite piece that is very, very fun and very different. But like, there was so much of that. There was so much things that maybe we, we might not consider to be traditionally accepted at tournaments that I'm familiar with were everything was just allowed. Everything was like, whatever, like throw it in. We want to see all of it. And there was all of it. Mm-hmm. Some of it wasn't well painted. Some of it was more about like the layout and the setup, but it was, it was so inspiring just to see like how much people are like, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. And it was just, it was so creative. It was so creative. It was awesome. So uh, who were the judges? Do you know? They had three judges for each category. Mm-hmm. And for my category, which was uh, fantasy standard painting, um, it was uh, Mikhail Pisarski. Uh The other guy was, uh, his Instagram handle is like Zab Art. Z- he has like these really big orc busts that he makes. Oh, okay. Does that familiar? Yep, yep. I don't know the third guy. Uh, Eric Swinson was a judge of a fantasy master painting. Um, there was the, along with him was a Polish gal and the guy who runs Nordley's miniatures, who was a Danish dude. I can't remember his name. Yeah. Jakob. Um, and then, uh, then if you look at the website, they actually show you all the judges. There's a lot of people that I'd never heard of before. A lot of, uh, Italian dudes mm. I'd never heard of before. Right. Is there, it's being run by and organized by a group and they use their own staff to make sure that they get holes all filled and everything. That makes sense. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Um, and then like in the evenings, basically, basically <laughs> I loved it. They would, they would close the event, I think from one to three so everyone could go have lunch and like, you couldn't look at the models. It seemed like a very, like, you know, kind of like a siesta, you know, that's a very European thing. And all the businesses were also closed other than the food ones. And so we'd all go outside. There's a pavilion to sit under, or you could just stand in the streets. It was wait, t- everything was closed in the town. Yeah. Other than the restaurants for two hours. Yeah. In the middle it's of the like day? A, it's like a siesta. Uh, I think it happens in Spain, or too, as well. Take a break. Um, and uh, the there was a, a vendor on the street that made these porchetta sandwiches and burgers. And you could go up and you just get a sandwich and a burger and you just kind of hang out in the pavilion area and just chat with, with hobbyists while you're eating. And then the show opens back up and maybe you go in there and you mingle a little bit, look at some new pieces, talk about the pieces, you share feedback, receive feedback. And then you also go out, hang out in the pavilion, and chat with people. You know, I got to see Steve Garcia, got to see Valbjorn, Jason. Uh, I saw that. Um, I, I got to see a lot of people. There were some people to talk about and and, and chat with. Um, on and I, so a note a noteworthy event that happened on night one was this inauguration process where Francesco makes this drink in a big vat with a wooden paddle, and it's an alcoholic drink, and he brings it out. And originally, everyone used to drink from the same cup. Uh, like you got like communion, you know, and this time we had plastic cups and probably last time as well for everyone individually, but you have to kneel down on the ground. If you're a first timer there. So I had to do this Oh, you have to kneel down in the center of this pavilion area. And Francesco is like standing on a table above you, you know, like pouring you drinks. <laughs> so you kneel down, you drink the fucking drink and you scream. I am a believer. <laughs> That's what you have to do. So I'm pretty sure I'm part of a call. I'm yeah, not, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, there's a blood contract. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, like uh, people were telling me like, Oh, they're going to circumcise you as part of this event. <laughs> I was just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so that was hilarious to see a bunch of people just kneel down and, and do that. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's, the, it is the, something like that just reminds you like, this is more than just going to a physical location, taking part in, in a, an event thing. Like it is, it is, it is bigger. It is about the community. It's about the, the shared experience it's about the welcoming nature of it it's like that's that's pretty awesome yeah it was pretty, pretty cool awesome. that was pretty cool um i think on day one i also had some amazing gelato uh i had a tiramisu flavored gelato and it was like it was fucking awesome and it was cheap everything was cheap i loved it it was so cheap um and man what happened after that so that that was the night where i stayed up for a decently long time friday and saturday i believe um and People were just buying me beers endlessly. Oh boy! Fucking uh, Ricardo Agostini walks around and pulls out a unmarked bottle of limoncello and a plastic cup and pours it to me, hands it to me, and just fucking walks away. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and someone else did that too. Some uh, some Swedish dude like poured some sh- a shot for me and I took it and he just walked away. 
Uh, so I'm amazed that I did not get roofied, you know, because uh, no. I was I was breaking all the rules. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you hand over your glass at all times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, people get buying me beers. I got super drunk on the first long, first long day, whatever that day was. Thursday. Uh, no, I went to bed Thursday right away. So oh, it was Friday, Friday, Friday. Yeah. Um, so that, that was, that was a ton of fun. I chatted with, uh, your boy, Christoph. Oh, I chatted with David Aroba. I chatted with a guy who runs and operates era models. Uh, I chatted with just, just so many people that are there to run, run, rub elbows with the one person I didn't, I ch- chatted with Ben comments a little bit. Uh, the one person I didn't really talk to at all that I really regret not talking to just because like, I don't know. I don't know. I never know if, how much English they know how to speak. I don't want to like force myself on them. Um, Mark Musclons was there. Oh. He's, you know, I kind of, I kind of love Mark and the way he paints. I, did, yeah. I just never talked to him because he's, he's, he's in his like little Spanish speaking circle. Yeah, and I don't want to be the one guy that shows up that forces everyone to speak English. You know, Ola. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like that. You yeah. know, like like Brad Pitt. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, I didn't talk to him. Uh, there was well, one thing I wanted to touch on, uh, or that I wanted to ask you on. It was uh, something we had talked about before this, where you had a, a slight trepidation about. Um, feeling a little bit like an like an outsider, or like that you weren't quite in the 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 crew, the, the kind of crew that go to Monty. Yeah, 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 yeah. How did that play out? Did you feel that 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 was that different than what you thought? Did it evolve over the time there? Is, was your takeaway from the event? So we always talk about going to an event and going with friends, right? Mm-hmm. And so I went with friends, but those friends also had other friends that they wanted to go with. It was kind of like Curtis coming with us to Adepticon, sure, right? Sure, sure. And so Roman had other German-speaking people that he wanted to hang out with and, and chat with, and just, and just other people that he meets at Monty. It's like his eighth, ninth time going. So mm-hmm. it's like he has things that he wants to do as well. And so I didn't have anyone that was like home base yeah. to go back to. Um, and so it did still feel kind of a little bit like I'm a little bit kind of out here. and Floating a little bit. Floating a little bit. Yeah. And like the people that – are going to talk to me the most are people that are that know about our podcast, know about my YouTube channel. And like, you know, you kind of have the same, the same convo with them over and over again. Sure. But despite that slightly negative review, everyone I chatted with was so fucking nice. Mm. And I didn't get any, any vibe of elitism about you're not welcome here. It was the total opposite of that. Everyone was like, Ricardo Agostini just pouring me a fucking drink and then taking a hike. Like that was so chill and just so like, I love this. Uh, so I felt I felt from from like what how they were behaving and, and treating me, I felt super welcome. I think what that means is that uh, when I see him at Adepticon, I just need to go up to him and give him a little f- one of your fireball and walk away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. This is this is, Ameri- this is, is American <laughs> hospitality. <laughs> he's like, well, what is this bullshit? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and just walk away. Just walk away. Um, uh, yeah, I I get that. Like, I I think I would feel the same way. You feel a little bit like you you don't have a um. You kind of your safety blanket, yeah, kind of a thing, yeah. Um, but sometimes being out of that and being forced to being in that level of un- uncomfortability, you you get to a place you maybe wouldn't have gotten to otherwise. Yes, you know, yeah, that, that's true. You need to kind of push yourself a little bit every now and then. Yeah, oh. but, but speaking of Roman, he was an amazing host throughout this entire thing. Like he paid for all of my fucking food when I was in Germany, which is amazing. I did not ask him to do that. Uh, and then here he was like making sure that like he call, he called himself Mama Bear. He was like making sure everyone was okay. Uh, and like he he has apparently he has a snoring issue, so he literally picked up his bed and took it into a different room and slept elsewhere in the hotel <laughs> uh, because he didn't want to annoy anyone. So he was super considerate the entire time. So I I'm not, I don't want to make it seem like he wasn't like paying attention to me. Yeah, like you you weren't abandoned. No, I, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, not at all. Um. So that was pretty cool. All right. Pretty cool. So I have one final thing I want to ask you about. Yes, sir. Um, before we wrap this up. And that is I want an, I want the skinny on Roman the, Lepot. The so, skinny. So here's my thoughts. Okay. 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 S- Roman and I are not that different in age. No. Oh, my God. Yeah, we talked about this, too. Okay. We're roughly the same age. And I think we are, like, if there is a scale of, of black to white, we are on the opposite sides of the spectrum of <laughs> what people are like of our age (laughs) or I'm the most immature and I still can't buy a beer without getting carded. (laughs) And he is the most wise and grizzled version. And yet I catch from time and again, 
and whether it's on his YouTube videos or things he's made or comments that he makes, I I I sense some 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 com- comedy in that oh, man. Yeah. I sense some some lightheartedness, which is not at first glance what I would guess. No. Um, what's what's he really like? It's like meeting Vince V. You know, it's like on the surface, you think Vince V is this cold, calculating, like educational, like a nerd. By yeah, <laughs> by, by the books, fucking nerd, right? Yeah. Uh, and then he's just like, he's just not that at all. Yeah. You know, he's just fun. He's just fun to be around. And it's the same thing with Roman. Like he was, he was cracking jokes. He was, he was being, he's having fun. And so that, that that was that was cool to see too. It was not all business all the time. Oh man, that's great. I I really appreciate, and that's I think it's another thing. Like what I appreciate about you, Vince, as well, <laughs> and I feel like those two are are kind of cut from the same cloth. Is that they are really passionate and take a thing very seriously. They don't fuck around with the thing, but they are also such a well-rounded person that it almost surprises you yeah. that someone that is devoted so much of of who they are as a human to something mm-hmm. so passionately mm-hmm. that oh man, they're actually just also a well-rounded not wackadoo person <laughs> yeah yeah because like it's kind of braced for impact on that right yeah like, this is just going to be really awkward to be around a person a long time but that's that's pretty awesome is he coming to nova next year i think because uh i think he's having a child so i think he's probably not going to well i mean that's a lot later in the year um maybe uh he did he, he wasn't he was kind of not saying no to anything but the kid might slow down at the very least next year okay so because I know he didn't come this year and he had said something about, you know, not coming, but that he'll be back and he's excited to be back to Nova next year. Maybe things have been changed with the pregnancy or whatever because of that. But like, I, I really, Roman, if you watch this, you just get some, get some diapers, put them, put them on the table and just a little note. I'll be back in a week. <laughs> not actual advice. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't listen to me about any, <laughs> any advice. <laughs> particularly child rearing <laughs> uh a couple other notes uh we had a 14 course dinner at a restaurant called Labindi, and it had space only for our party they feed one party an evening holy shit um and it, the restaurant can fit like 40 uh maybe 50 there's like a table for like 25 upstairs and then, then two small tables downstairs and so we had a big party that we went to uh, Labindi with, and I didn't. I didn't know anyone there other than uh, Johannes and Roman, and I knew other people by name. Mm. Um, and this, this was this, this was that moment. This was the moment where I was like, "Ah, oh, I am at the dinner thing that I see pictures of yeah. doing the thing that I thought that I would never be able to do when I was a little kid or or, or younger and aware of this scene." Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was a moment of surrealness for me. Uh, so it was cool to. Hang out with uh, Conrad. Hang out with uh, uh, Anas uh, from uh, Denmark. We'll hang out with Johannes. Have a long conversation about mini painting there, and everyone else at the table. That was a really cool experience. Fourteen courses. We the whole group must have crushed at least ten bottles of wine, and then at least ten more bottles of various still or sparkling water because tap water is not a thing in Europe. Uh, you have to ask for it, and they give you dirty looks. Uh, so you got to pay for your water in Europe. Um, but all of that food. 14 courses, that many bottles of wine and water. Every person paid 50 euros. Oh my god! And it's one restaurant that's only custom serving one take, one, one meal. Group. Yeah, one group. Well, they did that 14 course meal one time in the evening. Bring, 50 euros brings me back around. This is all. The, all this stuff is puzzle pieces that are coming together. Remind me how many of professional miniature painters, painters that paint the highest level and they can fucking do that as a job are in Europe because that cannot exist in America. Dude, that would cost $300 in a America. Person? Each. Yeah, if, easily. If easily. you drank all that wine. The, the wine is the real kicker. That yes. would that would drive the cost. That, that would almost double the cost. Maybe not entirely, but like, fuck, dude. 14 courses. 14 courses. Well, you have to think about how many staff people that need to be, make all their money plus profit for the the owner plus food costs plus like all of that it's like no that's why they have to turn over tables so quickly yeah. and then they don't tip they don't tip jeez what what yeah. is going on in europe cost of living baby that's what it is fucking a uh cost so that was living. insane that that was that cheap and yeah. great, great great conversation people that i've heard only in name and never met before so it was awesome to finally put a name to the face obviously my face and your face are plastered all over the internet 
but all we see are models and an internet moniker. Yes. I don't know your face or your name. And so had a lot of moments where it was like, Hi Scott. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> like yeah. I have no Oh, you're you're that person on Instagram. Okay, now I know what we're talking about, but how did that a couple times? I feel like I'd often have my phone out and say, you know, like tell tr- it's real hard to try not be try to be coming across as egotistical or whatever. It's like no, I just want you to tell me your handle so I can look it up so I can tell which models I'm sure I've seen of yours yes. to place them so I can and can react correctly or ask you or whatever or yeah. be impressed. Obviously, I know I'm going to be, so let me just yeah, yeah, yeah. correct that. So that's Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Great. So, yeah, then I, I left Sunday morning, um, and I had to get my pieces Saturday night, which was not normal. People would normally stay for the whole thing. And they had different security guards there this time on, on Saturday evening, and none of them spoke English. And so I was like, I was like, I want to take this piece. I'm leaving early. I spoke to Ricardo. He said it was okay. And they were like, what? And I was like, okay, I can't just take my models. Like they're going to fucking tackle me. I got to uh, take them a piece. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had to have Francesco come over and translate to the security guard that I was leaving and, and grabbing my models. Um, and then we drove to the airport and me and uh, Val Bjorn had a wonderful conversation about uh, like his, his like career and the hobby and what and how it led to this. And we also talked about fantasy movies that he's seen, 80s fantasy movies, and that was a ton of fun. Uh, he's a great guy. Like he, I want to have him come to the office, be on the podcast. He wants to teach a class here about converting and kit bashing and sculpting on a weekend. But I think I think he's got the uh, the chops to teach that class. I, th- I think he does. <laughs> I think he does. And also, he's just he's just so pleasant to hang out with. He's such a nice dude. Everyone there was so fucking nice. I feel like that's kind of always how it is. Um, he, he he was at. Uh, Adepticon last year, wasn't he? He was. Uh, yeah. We just didn't get a chance to talk. I, I gave him the space that I painted of his, and then that was that's kind of all the interaction I did with him. But I feel like I caught him in passing, but I didn't really get to talk to him. He's so nice. Cool. He's so nice. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was a great experience. Incredibly creative. Very inspiring. Um, very very tiring. Uh, a lot of Bad. there was it was you were on every single day, and we I slept, and then I went back into it. Right, mm-hmm. and so you were just you're a lot lot of chatting. Um, a lot of people uh, knew us for the podcast. We have we have fans in Mexico of our podcast wow. that were there at Monty. Um, I mean, bro, it's 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 high level beautiful painting and talking with high level beautiful painters. That's <laughs> that's all it is. So if you like that, which that's kind of like the main thing that I like about Depticon, it's an amazing event. Mm. Um, so I, I recommend going at least one time. That'd be amazing if you could if you could swing that. Yeah, and but then once you're uh, christened, then <laughs> then you're expected. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, it's then written into your will. You must like <laughs> you, you must give fifteen percent of your value to the Monte Sansovino show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but, but you know it's fine. You're dead at that point anyway. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, right. Yeah, your soul has been sold, bro. You're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds like an awesome trip. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. And we're going to hop on over to the news. And we're going to try to keep this pretty short today because we've had a nice long topic. We don't want to wear everyone's ears out. Um, They had a couple of reviews. I'm looking through the news topic. But we had a couple of new model spoilers for uh, Warhammer this past week. Um, Of course, we already talked about the Night Lords Kill Team Kit, which looked great. The new models for Flesh Eater Quartz. did you see the Tomb King thing? Yeah. It is fucking horrendous. Okay. It's not horrendous. The Lich dude is good. More than good. Everything else on that kid. That fucking dino bone dino looks like it was sculpted out of Play-Doh by a six-year-old. It is so, like, archaic looking. This thing? Yes. Okay. And then that canopy thing it's just bullshit on bullshit. I don't know what I'm looking at. It's yeah. just garbage on garbage. Yeah, this is like a it's like a fantasy mummy walker kind of, and it, it just it just, it doesn't look good. And then here's the other version of it, right? The one with the bone crocodile. Yeah, can you see the? Oh, they don't have the picture of the 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 giant thing that it's on is so bad. Um, <laughs> Of that one, it's just so bad. I just it, it honestly looks like it was sculpted to be cast in pewter, where oh. everything's really like haunched low. That's it. That's the thing. Doesn't okay. it look like it's cast in pewter? Yeah, it, it looks. I don't know about the pewter, but I understand what you're saying about it. It's just like the two elements just seem so detached. They're so separate and not at all married together. Yes. 
Um, and there's just so much like it's just like squished down. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, there's, there's no interesting movement yeah. or shapes or pose oh, to the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It looks like an old fantasy dragon. It does. Yeah. It does. And then the head sculpt is just like, what the hell is this? It's kind of trying to be in a crocodile skull, but. Well, this is this is how we get uh, Tomb Kings getting uh, uh, removed from the game a second time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, those flash eater course models are fucking real nice. Real, real nice. Some of them are real nice. I, I, like not, I'm not probably not gonna buy the range, but like the executioner guy, like this guy. Oh yeah, that guy's a bit of me. Full show. Yeah. Did you see the uh, the Pope dude? Yeah, the Pope guy is. <laughs> I love that dude too. Yeah, like he he's hilarious. And to me, I love how. To me, that shows that GW can still have fun with Warhammer. Uh -huh. And so I love that. I think Flesh Eater Courts have a little bit more freedom with that, kind of having fun. Um, so that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So that was that was pretty nice. It was some fun new reveals. Kind of out of nowhere. Wasn't yeah. expecting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Iron Painter is phasing out the War Paints range in favor of the War Paints Fanatic, which is interesting to me because I feel like the Fanatic range made it seem like they were coming to be like the pro paints. And then the other paints were like kind of like – the the stuff that you use if you're beginning if you don't have you know a lot of budget like that's what you would get but apparently they're getting replaced yeah that's it, it kind of makes sense to me because it seemed like the marketing um kind of words that they were saying around it were about like new and improved and like uh fixing things within the formula and creating a better overall final product if you were going to do that, why would you have a separate line? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it just seems like we're just making 2.0 version. Um, yeah. So it's like, it would, I, I always, I always assumed it was just going to phase out the old one. Cause at least that's. And then when I talked to army painter, that's how they, maybe that's how they brought it up to me. So maybe I just didn't realize it wasn't common knowledge, but yes, that's, that's a good thing. And you used them. Haven't you? Yeah. 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 Totally, totally fine. I think they're a little sticky. You know how some paint can feel a little sticky sometimes? Yeah, it's a little tech. Yeah, so I don't use them fully thick, or at least I haven't. I, whenever I thin it with water, like a little tiny amount, then it's like, okay, it's a normal paint. Sure. Um, But, like, yeah, I think I used some brighter colors, like some, like some lighter skin tone highlights, and they felt, like, a little sticky. But, like, otherwise, I... Again, all paint is so similar. So it, it, it worked. And I've never used the old stuff, which I know got a lot of shit. But this definitely is not deserving of any amount of, of shit. It's totally it's totally usable. Cool. Yeah, I haven't used their new stuff. I, I've tried the a fair bit of their their old set. but uh, Yeah, and they were at Depticon. Sorry, they were at Monte San Savino. I thought it was really cool to have a company at this tiny event in an official capacity. They had a little building called the, the Dane House. Uh, where they had all their cameras and lights and paint set up, and they were bringing painters to the house to try the paint out and film first-time reactions. Um, so I thought it was just cool that a company was gave a shit about this small event and was there. You know, that's a pretty that's a that's a pretty. <laughs> I just had to cough, but I couldn't get it out. <laughs> That's, that's a pretty awesome thing is supportive thing for the yeah. you know, supporting community is, is or companies are supporting the community. It's pretty smart. Yeah. And they're big. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big company, Ari Painter. So it's yeah. not like a small indie company is at Monte San Savino. It's like a larger one. Yeah. I got to pee again. All right. John's going to pee. I'm going to go through this news that he does not care about. Nope. Um, we'll do a little Kickstarter corner from James. Deceased Zombicide, but with characters from the DC Comics by Simon. So I... I uh, I've been aware of this for a little bit, but this is the this is more Zombicide, but instead of Marvel, uh, DC characters now. Oh, and look at that. You got Blue Beetle and <laughs> Static Shock and Dev Man. So, yes, Blue Beetle confirmed is a DC character for sure. Um, I don't know. You know, me, me and Zombicide, it's kind of just the same game over and over again. It kind of feels like it's, it's getting into this wow territory, right? Where it's like you play one, two, three three expansions of World of Warcraft, and you're kind of like, you know, I kind of know what the next game has to offer for me. And the people that are still playing WoW are like the people that are like diehard fans, people that like to collect things. And I feel that same way about Zombicide. People buying Zombicide are buying it for the collection, buying it to have more Zombicide sets, buying it because they like the subject matter. So if they're DC fans or if they're Marvel fans or if they're Western fans, they'll buy like the Western version of Zombicide. Um, and maybe this is unfair, but I've played two versions of Zombicide, one of the original mall ones and then uh, Wolfberg. 
Um, and they, they felt like the same game. Um, so Or a similar game, but just with a different skin. So uh, that's cool. If you like DC stuff, check that out. Um, I don't know what this is about, but this is interesting. Spiky Bitch was given the chance to buy $500,000 of gray market Warhammer. The new inbox product was being sent to a landfill in Memphis and didn't make it. The images included in the article have lead Spiky Bits have led Spiky Bits to believe the value was closer to a milli at full retail and included a lot. And the original article includes links of there. This discounted product might possibly be available to purchase at a discount. Uh, though we should keep in mind that we do not know why it was disposed of. It could be improper casting or a myriad of other inbox issues. Uh, probably test sprues, maybe. Uh, that you know, because like production of plastic models is hard, right? They're not going to nail it on attempt one, so they're probably going to try different layouts, different flows, and try things out. It's a weird thing to happen that they'd be in uh, the United States because they're not manufactured in the United States. There is GWHQ is in Tennessee, uh, close to if not in Memphis, so that makes sense why there would be sprues there, but they're not manufactured there. You're right. So, so. Th- why would they? Sh- ship them all the way over there if there's yeah wrong with yeah them. i have no idea but Weird. they gotta come from gw right like no one's making like bootleg sprues of, of gw yes. sprues right yeah so it's from them um interesting little thing that the article looked below if you want to look more into that cool uh, i talked about the kickstarter corner uh legion imperialis came out um which is epic scale models um oh, sorry it's available now november 18th which will definitely have happened by the time this episode comes out Otherwise, you know, kind of just you G- know, GW releases. You know, news. Yeah. Uh, there was there's something about. I was thinking there was something about uh, Golden Demon. Oh, they still haven't announced a Golden Demon for uh, the UK yet, which I guess is like it should have been announced by now. And it then comes out like April, March, right? Like it comes out soon thereafter, soon after Adepticon, right? Yeah. It's only like a month and a half, I think, after. Yeah. So it's kind of, I hear people that are like painting for it or, or not sure about stuff about like, oh, you know, category change in America. Are those going to be the exact same category? I would sure hope so because yeah. they, they hadn't gone through an iteration to know whether they're good or bad or otherwise anyway. But like, there's kind of rumblings about about that, but I I don't take that as people are saying like there's not going to be one. Mm. It's just kind of confusing. Um, there's rumors around that it, it has to do with the fact that there might not be um, this. They're looking for a space to be able to uh, organize a sp- uh, or book a space big enough um, to to hold it. Okay. Because they had like a bigger one last year, but I don't. It's like the only place that you can book such a thing in Nottingham of that size or in the area of that size, and that if it's already booked, like they're kind of hosed. So, yeah. So anyway, event space is the problem, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. All right. That'll be it for the news. All right. Here's the end of the podcast. You made it here. You are one of the victorious ones standing a pop, a pop, atop a, a pile of dead goody peepees because you made it all the way here with your. Conan the Barbarian Tendi slaying self uh, and you know the reward you would get <laughs> you get to hear about how you can support the podcast <laughs> <laughs> I do think we need to have a shirt that is that just a silhouette of a fucking Conan dude holding up a Tendi <laughs> well, who, who's the hot babe on the side is it, who, who is that person is fucking Bob style bread <laughs> Like <laughs> Bob style bread, dude. <laughs> All right. Uh, if, if, if you like the podcast, again, uh, two main ways to support us, both Patreon and also merch. Uh, merch, we got tons of fun things like uh, three different t- t-shirt designs, some hoodies, some cups for your paint water. And then for the podcast, you can uh, enroll at the $5 level and get access to an extended episode, which is 20 minutes longer than the normal one about. You get access to uh, submitting your models for feedback uh, uh, for us during an episode. And also you get to uh, suggest topics for us to discuss during an episode. And we credit you when we use that topic. So five bucks a month, you get all of that. And also the knowledge that you have impeccable taste in podcasts. Mm, yes, you know? it's the most important thing. Is it's the most flex, important thing. Flex on people. So you can also really. flex by. Uh, did you mention merch? Because I didn't. I wasn't paying attention. I, I was, did I mention was, merch. Thank you for being here with me, co-host. I was, dude, I was. I was mentally designing the the t-shirt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like that. It's the He-Man pose. You were imagining Bob Sal Bragg with titties. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, but now I am. But I gotta be that fucking. It's gotta be flesh eater, corn saggy titties. 
<laughs> oh man. Oh uh, man, I'd eat that bread. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't? Who fucking wouldn't? Dude, tastes good and looks good. <laughs> Looks good, tastes good. <laughs> That's a different shirt. The different shirt is just a piece of fucking garlic bread with saggy titties on it. Oh and then it says, says tastes good, looks good. Says, looks good, tastes good. <laughs> We're getting off the rails here. There's actually a person at Monty Sansovino uh, who was a female who was very polite, more of a board game painter, and she was a fan of the podcast. And she was like, she's like, you guys act like little boys the perfect amount. And I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, oh, thank God. Like, <laughs> Thank God we don't overdo it. Uh, that, was, oh. that was a good review, though. <laughs> the perfect amount. Yeah, my wife disagrees. <laughs> uh, well, that's it for this fort. Now we're going to catch you on the next one. Until then, we'll see you on the Lippity Flop.